and um, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte and the governing body of all other special assessment and taxing districts for which said board so acts is now meeting in regular session. Only those items that indicate a specific time will be heard at the assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. Um, I am filling in for Supervisor Short today who is homesick with a cold. Um, and so I'm hoping not to screw up too bad. But with that, Madam Clerk, can you please take the roll? Supervisor Howard? Present. Supervisor Wilson? Here. Supervisor Borges? Here. Vice Chair Starkey? Here. And now if we could have a moment of reflection. Great, thank you. And now if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Supervisor Howard. Thank you for that. Um, now I'd like to have the introduction of new employees. Is there are new employees that are here today? Diego Lopez, do you know of any new employees that are going to be in uh, Not today, Vice Chair. Okay, perfect. So at this time, the Chair requests any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda at this time. In order to add an item to the agenda, the matter must have come to the attention to the county subsequent to the posting of the agenda, and the matter requires action before the next regular meeting on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we are going to pull item number 19 from the agenda today. Um, are there any other items that the Board would like to have pulled? Okay, seeing none, so we will pull number 19 at this time. All right, at this point, we're going to receive other brief reports or announcements relative to the County of Del Norte programs and projects, progress on the two-by-two two committees, goal committees, and or board and staff travel and training reports. Do we have any reporting out? Supervisor Howard. Very good. Good morning. Um, wanted to report out just on a couple things. I uh, was at the... California State Association of Counties meeting last week. We chaired a reasonably well attended session of uh, Agriculture, Environment, and Natural Resources uh, Goals Committee. We discussed uh, several things around the upcoming fire season and more importantly the fire modeling. We had the state fire marshal in town and we really got a little bit critical on the fire maps that we've all discussed here at length and how we as a community are reeling with models that generate presumed science that generates these borders that we now get put into these fire severity classes, high, medium, low. And obviously there was a lot that was tweaked in Delaware County that just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like there was a lot of red areas, which is the highest of high categories in an area that it shouldn't be. And then you look south towards the Sonoma and they're in low and moderate. And we know that can't possibly be right. So those are the kind of questions that many folks who attended that meeting uh, asked and more importantly we need to be prepared for as a county and as a board to respond to this because when we do get this information back after they have felt that they've made the corrections that they're going to make um, we're going to only have 30 days to respond to this and I don't think capacity wise at least within community development um, we're going to have the knowledge or expertise in which to really take a hard look at these models and make effective communications back to the state. And so we'll probably have to rely on our, our friends and teammates, our employees down at uh, UC Extension, uh, people like Jana Valenkovic, who you guys are both familiar with, um, to really dive into this for us and for folks like in Humboldt and Trinity Counties because they're gonna be partners in having probably the same communication we are, but that was a very effective piece of the conversation. Obviously at the California State Association of Counties conferences, this is our ledge conference, and it's really about lobbying across the street and at the Capitol. And I spent a lot of time with Jim Wood at this one, had him for a few hours actually, and really uh, discussed 
proactive approaches around Highway 101 and more importantly, what movement we're seeing in Highway 199 and getting out of the mess that we've been in since 2012, but also really focused around homelessness issues here and what his expectations are for the CARES Court piece rolling out, what he sees for Del Mar County and more importantly with the mental health package that the governor's really pushing quite hard right now, which saddles a hell of a burden with this county and other counties around us in particular, any rural county in the state of California, and then also workforce housing. We just have a hard time finding cheap, affordable housing for our workforce here in Delmar County. And it's one thing that we really need to find a way to address, and it's very difficult to address when there's so many added costs with, with the California statutes and building code that have been added on over time, whether it's a particular type of roof, a particular type of window that you have to have, or a sprinkler system in the house if you're in this area. Those are all barriers to building homes for a lot of folks. So we really need to take a hard look at those and those are what we discussed. I had um, the delegation here from Japan here uh, last week. They flew out for the dedication of the memor uh, mural in Beachfront Park that Bob Mungers did. That was incredible. Then also an incredible ceremony at um, the Crescent Oak Middle School. And I really got to thank uh, Supervisor Starkey for really taking on the true meaning and learning lessons that have taken place around this relationship as it relates to being prepared for any type of emergency, but in this case, tsunami preparedness. As you know, we are the epicenter for tsunami when it comes to the West Coast, and Valerie and her team over there at the Cultural Center led over a 1,000 children through emergency preparedness over a day. And the feedback and response was absolutely incredible. So big pat on to you, Valerie, for, for really taking charge of this and making it tick. It was a great and successful event. Attended a resource conservation district meeting in Smith River, and then also uh, attended the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District meeting where we really dove into uh, unfunded liabilities associated with PERS and PEPRA. Um, the Air Quality District's uh, unfunded liability right now is running about 3.3 uh, million, um, which is quite a bit lower than obviously down our counties, but we're thinking about taking a large chunk of their reserve and throwing it into basically a 113 plan trust, which allows us to make some strategic buy downs, potentially, if that's how we want to spend it and reserve it if we need it for something else at a later date. Um, was invited on a rafting trip and went down the North Fork of the Smith River for the first time in 28 years. That was absolutely incredible. I never knew Del Norte County looked like this. It was, if I was there and dropped in, it, it looked nothing like Del Norte County, completely different kind of geology. It's a geology that actually goes into one of our conversation topics specifically about metals today and, and what those metal, residual metals are in our, in our water quality reports. But, um, we were with Region 9, um, the Region 9 Director, Jennifer. Um, she runs the state of Hawaii, uh, Oregon, California, Arizona for the Forest Service. She replaced Randy Moore that was appointed in Washington, D.C., and then also Ted Ward, our regional forester. Um, both great people, great to spend time with them and really learn about their priorities for the forest, which affects us a great deal. And where the, where the resources are coming from, because they don't have many right now, and I know we advocate for them a lot, especially through the Smith River Collaborative. Also having a great deal of communications with CDD right now on two items in particular, one in the North Fork Loop and the Gasky CSD providing water up there to residents on the North Fork Loop. And then uh, one that's come up that I don't know if we'll make it to the board, but it's an interesting discussion, is around permitting the Gaf Gasky raft races, which has never been done, and they're looking for a permit, which, uh, I don't know if we want to get into that kind of business, but um, for certain we do have to have a discussion about it, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of why the Legion might be asking for a permit right now. And that's the end of my report. Thank Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. And the real interesting things there. And then Supervisor Wilson, did you have something? So uh, since my last report, we've been uh, busy on the uh, homeless uh, uh, encampments and working with our group on trying to determine and, and find resolutions to help us move forward with the homeless issues. We've had several meetings. Um, we had one setback, but we, we are now trying to uh, uh, move towards uh, locating that uh, potential uh, shelter on, on Herald, uh, making it a permanent 24-hour 365 shelter 
Um, the funding is there. Uh, we have in talks with the uh, current owner of that uh, piece of property, and uh, it looks promising that we may have that move forward. We are looking at other alternatives towards additional uh, whether it is pallet home housing, temporary housing, and also looking at low cost permanent housing locations so that uh, we can move through a process of transitioning from the homeless on the street into those various steps to eventually being out. Also working with, uh, with the county council and determining on the correct policies that can be adopted once these uh, shelters are in place and the mechanisms are in place uh, to help control the homeless uh, out in and about various areas in Del Norte County throughout areas. We're also working with County Council on, on having uh, those private property parcels that are there that do have uh, a, a large collection of homeless on how we can effectively uh, mitigate that issue and do cleanups and not have them just go back in and, and continue to uh, habitate those areas. And part of that is, is getting these alternatives in place as well as policy in place. So we have had several meetings since this last report that I gave, and we are moving in a positive direction, I feel. Um, there are resources out there, dollars out there. It's just a matter of being able to tap into those dollars and move in that direction. Um, I've attended uh, several uh, mental health uh, meetings uh, at DHHS uh, with their committees and looking at various programs that will help to augment and as well as buffer on some of these issues dealing with uh, those homeless that have mental health issues. Um, my big concern is that we have things like care court and other issues that are coming out. However, even though the dollars are there and there is a timeline attached to these programs to have them up and running, the problem is that we're facing is get what every state is going to every county is going to face because this is going out statewide is that we're all being uh, asked to put these programs into place and yet the uh, professional expertise necessary psychologists psychiatrists clinicians and others uh, are a limited resource and yet we're expected to be able to implement these programs and compete with every other county in the state of California that are putting these programs on also. So it is, it is going to be a heavy lift to make the time uh, requirements at the same time when we are trying to go out and grab professional services that are required necessary to put these programs on successfully. Uh, we may be looking at regional types of operations uh, collectively with other counties to try to deal with some of these issues going forward because there are many, especially with care court. Um, I've had uh, several discussions with uh, and uh, attempted to attend a meeting at uh, with the uh, uh, Birch Water Tra uh, Birch Ocean View uh, District. Um, unfortunately, they, they didn't have their meeting last night, so wasn't able to attend. Um, we've had several discussions. Uh, we've had a, I've attended a LAFCO and Tri Counties uh, meetings, uh, Tri Agency meeting, uh, as to whether or not how we can help with economic development in our in and around Del Norte County in a specific way and we'll be having a meeting later on today to discuss that. That's the end of my report. Thank you. That's great information about the homeless issues that you've been working so hard on. Supervisor Borges. Yeah, I just have a couple things to I thought the public would like to know about is um, having the uh, Redwood Coast Transit Authority meeting um, they are implementing a new program um, through their dial ride system to service the airport now. It's in the early phases of rolling out. Um, and so you would call ahead and you could get dropped off at the 7 a.m. flight and picked up at the 7 p.m. flight, um, which I think would be very beneficial to a lot of people that are struggling to get to the airports. Um, they're in the slow phases of implementing an app for that to be able to book and schedule your drop-offs and pickups from your phone, which I think would be great. Um, so it's there's be more literature coming out, but it's in the early phases. So if you're needing a ride there, um, look at RCT. And then the other thing that's being discussed now is a small rate increase for the daily riders, and it's very small, but um, we're looking for public input on it. 
And so um, if you're able to attend any of the future meetings to give any input, I don't want to assume it's not going to affect anybody, because, um, but we need to know. Um, our next meeting for that is on May 22nd. Um, so we need input, and it's not looking to be implemented, if at all, until the fall. So um, we're just looking for any opinions on that. That's all I have. Thank you. So for me, I um, give up the newsletter, so that is available online, but I'll just touch upon some of the um, higher level meetings that I attended. The first five commission, we attended that meeting, and we approved the strategic plan for five years from 22 to 27 with so goals for child health, early learning, family, community support. And we spoke about the home visiting program, which will bring services to the parents so that they're set up for success in that first five years of a child's life. Um, I did participate, as Supervisor um, Howard mentioned, in the um, Kamome Festival. It was the first annual Kamome Festival. And what was important about it for me was the um, teaching our kids not only the story about the Kamome, but also how it interrelates with the disaster, because the disaster is really what brought that boat over here, and making sure that our children, in a fun time, experience what it's like to be prepared for emergencies. Each child got a go bag, they came in, they had a lot of fun within the cultural center, the first responders were there along with city workers and they were interacting with the kids. I honestly think some of those first responders had more fun in the, the games than the kids did. Um, but it was really good positive feedback from the teachers about the event. And we are hoping to do more of those kind of community engagement type activities in the future. I think those are good to build community and it's good for our children to come together. I attended the Area 1 Advisory Council meeting. Um, soon, uh, Maureen and Rose and I are going to be conducting key informant interviews to help us develop the next five-year strategic plan. As we know, our baby boomers are kind of taking front and center. Um, with that, our baby boomers are retiring, and they're going to also have health issues. So we really have to think of a strategic plan that's going to work for a community and take that community approach for that. Um, Good news is that the Area 1 has hired a full-time employee that is going to be dedicated to Del Norte County only. I am more than thrilled to hear this because there are programs that we are somehow being overlooked for because we don't have that coordination up here. And that includes, you know, exercise programs for the elderly as, all, as well as a fall prevention program where we can work with elderly who need grab bars installed in their house, who maybe need something that can help them stay in their homes longer. Um, with that, we attended an older adult roundtable from uh, Del Norte County. And like Supervisor Board just said, our CTA is, is coming up with new programs, not only for the airport, but they're also um, discussing, you know, it might be a little premature on my part to say, to report this, but how they can actually provide transportation to doctor's appointments outside of the area, so to Eureka and to Medford. And so they're looking at ways in which we can't coordinate something like that so that our um, elderly population who tend have a tendency not to be able to find rides can get to those doctor's appointments. Um, I met with some community partners to create a trash cleanup group, um, similar to what Supervisor Gitlin had done in the past. Um, following our Walmart cleanup, we were collaborating uh, with a few good men to create a cleanup group to offer elderly and those on a fixed income some opportunity to go in and help them clean up their property. So we're working with code enforcement as kind of a quasi partnership so they can help us identify those who are actually in need of assistance. Um, we kind of landed on the name trash kickers, but I I'll take any kind of feedback. I kind of just like the, the ring to that. Um, I met with Center Coast Hospital staff. I think that's important for us to touch base with them every quarter or so. Um, so I had lunch with Mitch Hanna and Ellie Popovich. Um, to see what their needs are with regard to mental health. Last week, the day that we had lunch, I think it was Thursday, there was 30 people in their emergency room at that one time. They the average, they see between 40 and 50 people a day, but at that moment in the time that we were having lunch, there was 30 people, and many of them had the mental health issues. So we are looking for ways to really keep supporting Center Health and to come up with ways in which we can provide other transportation for those who need acute care and how to get them to those hospitals. 
Um, I attended the quarter two Middle Mile Council's advisory meeting. And now the initial plan for the Middle Mile was to build 75% of the broadband now and to lease 25% of the IRAs, which is the indefensible rights of use. And that would be the existing cable that is there. Um, it meets the criteria for the 288 count fiber cable. But this month through thir further research, is now being proposed to use 50% IRUs, 30% Caltrans build, 15% joint build, and to buy 5%. And what that is going to do by pivoting that way, it's going to cut down the time of this uh, project considerably. It's going to be a major cost savings to the state. So what we're trying to really accomplish is by 2026 is to have that middle mile ready so that we have broadband availability throughout the whole state of California. So that is exciting and there's some uh, movement there. And finally, I attended uh, the Juvenile Justice Council Commission meeting and we discussed their annual plans for two of their grants and that was interesting to, to watch. And it turned into a real robust conversation about the services that are still needed and how this new grant that we applied for and was accepted for um, can be allocated to provide gaps in those services. So the JJCC has opted to have more frequent meetings, so we will keep that conversation going. And that is it for my report. So now we are not ready for our timed item, so the consent agenda, I'd like to call that. Comments from members of the public may be heard at this time regarding matters on the consent agenda only. Are there any items that the board would like to have pulled for the consent agenda? Okay, I would like to have um, number five pulled, uh, number eight pulled, those two things. So with that, with five and eight being pulled, um, can I get a motion for the remaining items? I move to approve the consent agenda minus item number five and number eight. Second that motion. Okay, now I'd open up to for public comment for consent agenda items um, one through four, six, seven, and then nine through twelve. Is there any public comments? Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, Morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, consent agenda, again, is being used to put more government in place, government sponsoring more government. You know, it's easy to see the direction we're going when you look at the county budget. You know, and where we're investing our money, right? What matters to us? You know, so what does our budget suggest about Del Mar County? And what are our priorities? You know, are our parks maintained? You know, are they accessible for kids? Not really, right? Our baseball parks are locked up. Why? There's no kids that need to go out and practice. They don't want to go play in the park. We pay for those services. I tell you why, because you look at the budget, mental health, 11.2 million. Mental health services, 12.8 million. Welfare administration, $17.7 million. Welfare assistance, $21 million. What does our rec department get? So what matters to you guys? Hiring eight more DHS employees, promoting more depression, promoting mental illness. How long are we gonna continue to just tolerate and condone bad behavior? You know, eight positions, how much are, are those eight positions gonna cost a year? Huh? How much are we adding? A million dollars a year? I 
I know I won't get any answers. Just request that you realize your impact. 13 or so items today, they each carry weight. They make a difference. And you can say no, there's an alternative. There's many, maybe many alternatives. But we gotta stop lowering the standard. We gotta improve the standard. Thank you for your time. Please do not hire eight more DHS staff. Thank you, Mr. Bieber. Any other um, public comment for consent agenda items only? All right, seeing none, um, Clerk Goffner, if you could please pull the vote. Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. All right, um, we will come back to five and eight. And I want to say I inadvertently forgot 13 on the consent. I hope that that uh, got included when I said eight through uh, 12, but I should have said 13, so. Real quick, Vice Chair, did you ask for um, any report out from closed session? I did not, thank you for that reminder. There, there's nothing. Thank you. That, whew, dodged a bullet. Okay, so let's move on to our timed items. Um, we have the 1025 uh, comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you are addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Are there any public comments, general public comments today? Yes, sir, come on up. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I may go a little over on the time, but uh, feel free to cut me off. I think I, I can get it under that. four minutes. It's my first time doing okay. this. So. Well, we have a three minute rule, so we'll start. Okay, well these okay. have been submitted with a couple other things Perfect. to Kylie, to the clerk. Um, my name is Michael Burns. I'm a member of, uh, I mean, I'm a member and a post service officer of American Legion Post 548 in Gasky. I've also been assigned to the Gasky Raft Race Committee. The Raft Race is in its 54th year. I initially was informed by Brian Daly from the California's Alcohol Beverage Control that they should contact Delmar County with regards to obtaining a county permit for this year's event. I contacted Brian due to the numerous problems with Post 548's liquor license and the need for a daily ABC license for the raft race. I was surprised to find out that the American Legion had not applied for a Delmar County permit in the past and that this process could take six to eight months as I was instructed by Jacob uh, in planning. But we should go ahead with, with the raft race without the permit. Uh, it would be appropriate to give a little brief history of this event because it was incorrectly reported in July 2006, uh, July of 2021 in the triplicate by uh, post uh, raft 48 Jamie Broussard that the Gasky Post created the raft race 52 years ago um, to raise money for veteran services. According to the Raft Race Coordinator, Gina Bowen, the Raft Race started in 1969 by the Mountain School PTA. It was called the Gasky Days Raft Race. Over the years, sponsors would change. Gasky Elementary School, and then the Gasky Volunteer Fire Department Women's Auxiliary, and then the American Legion, Legion took over the event. It's always been a community event. Legion does not own the Gasky Raft Race. The word that would best describe why there has not been a county use permit issued in the past would be indifference. The Gasky Raft Race is a well-known event that started in 69, but is predated by the 1967 Ordinance Code 20.48.30 that requires a Del Norte County permit for public assemblages. Like most other municipalities that issue permits for public event, Del Norte County has a duty to ensure the American Legion is compliant with all laws and has the proper insurances and other permits and licenses, safety measures, et cetera, in place as a condition of issuing a permit. The American Legion is all about law and order and this is written in the preamble of our constitution and our post operations manual states, it goes without saying that every American Legion's facility should lean over backward to abide by all laws regulating the operation of private clubs. 
If local public officials are inclined to overlook a few things in favor of private clubs, don't take advantage of the situation. Remind your members that one of the basic purposes of the American Legion is to maintain law and order. Even if officials should be willing to overlook infractions, you can be sure the public as well as many of your own members won't be. Now, Brian Daly from ABC is researching if he can even issue a daily license that allows Post 548 to sell alcohol without a common permit in place. Post 548 has previ previously purchased defense insurance. Commander Broussard informs it covers the American Legion, the Water District's property, and the U.S. Forest Service's Smith River. Mr. One would have to question if an event claim if an insurance claim would be honored without a valid Dornate Delmar County permit and safeguards in place. Mr. Burns, I'm sorry, your time is up. But I'm glad that you provided that letter, and I believe Mr. Howard is, is going to be asking that this be put on a future agenda for us to discuss. Is that correct? Okay. Potentially. He's well, still working through it. Well, so. thank you much. You know, I appreciate it. And I, I did submit the, uh, the code, as right. well as an article from 2019, Last Coast Outpost, right. about thank the Thank you so race, much so. for coming today. Thank you. Is there any other public comments? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Mana, and I am a resident of Douglas Park neighborhood in Hayuchi. Recently, Redwood National and State Parks announced it will postpone a pilot program for this summer aimed at reducing congestion along Howland Hill Road. The pilot program included a traffic pattern that would have included a one-way traffic direction west to east, resulting in 100% of the vehicles you know, going through the park, exiting the park through the Douglas Park neighborhood and Highway 199. Due to the expressed concerns of Douglas Park and Hayuchi residents, the park decided to postpone the program. This program would have increased traffic, congestion, and danger for <coughs> residents, pedestrians, and motorists along Douglas Park Drive and Highway 199. The number of vehicles traveling these roadways is not the most serious problem. The problem is that visitors rarely obey the posted speed limits. Along Douglas Park Drive, until just past the covered bridge, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour and 25 miles per hour for the remainder of the way to the East Park boundary and 15 miles an hour on Howland Hill Road. Excessive speed along any segment of these roadways is incredibly dangerous. I have resided in the Douglas Park neighborhood for 18 years. I frequently walk my dogs along Douglas Park Drive from my home near Second Bridge to the park boundary and back. Since the opening of the Titans Trail, traffic and the number of drivers speeding through the neighborhood has increased significantly. Regularly, I observe people driving 40 or 50 miles an hour through the 25 and 30 mile an hour zones and up to 60 miles an hour or more as they descend the approach to the covered bridge and continue to barrel toward the small neighborhood at the end of Douglas Park Drive. The park must address the increased congestion, but spending, excuse me, sending more vehicles through the Douglas Park neighborhood is not the answer, ever. We encourage Delmark County and the park to collaborate to address the problem of drivers ignoring speed limits. Increased patrols by law enforcement, additional speed signage, including signage painted on the pavement and flashing digital speed limit signs should be considered with implementation as soon as possible. Speed humps or, t or tables along Douglas Park Drive would force mot motorists to slow down. Intervention by Del Norte County and the park prior to this summer season is absolutely necessary. The status quo is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Mana. I, I wrote down your concerns and, and I'll reach out to you. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Donald Olson. I've uh, been a 67 year resident of Delmar County and spent the last 21 in Douglas Park. Uh, 20 years ago, there was rarely, there wasn't a traffic problem. I live on the downstream end of Douglas Park that historically is known as Poverty Flats because there was 
um, just some rundown old buildings, an old hotel, et cetera, back there when they used to cross the river via a stagecoach, et cetera. But over time, and with the onset of the Grove of the Titans, traffic has increased dramatically. The Park Service states that up to 500 cars a day now go through Douglas Park, either from west to east or east to west. Um, but what, and, and what the problem is not the volume of traffic, even though some might perceive it that way, it's the speed of traffic. And so we are here uh, to request some county support. And first of all, we also want to let you know that we are here to be part of the solution. We are not here to take jabs at people or be a thorn in your side, but I think by working together, we can solve this issue. So a couple of things we'd like to see put in place would be um, some traffic control measures. Um, if it's possible to put in a couple of speed tables, because what happens is traffic crosses Second Bridge, and when you start up Douglas Park Drive, where it begins by the mailboxes there, the road is quite wide, and, and it's uh, probably uh, fits the measurements for an official um, two-way road with shoulders, et cetera. But once you get past the covered bridge and enter lower Douglas Park, the road narrows drastically. And when, uh, the, even though the sign says 25 miles an hour, people don't adhere to that and they're going through there at 30 and 40, et cetera. So with that, um, once again, we would like to um, also remind you that the Park Service, the, the plan that they came up with was to ship everybody from west to east and then let people come in Douglas Park and turn around and start roving and go back out. And I think they really failed to look at the data because Highway 199 is the most dangerous highway in California. It's number one in fatalities. And the fewer cars that we can put on Highway 199, rather than forcing everyone there and uh, a large percentage of them twice, will be beneficial. Because we really want to see a solution for the betterment of Del Norte County, not just for Douglas Park, but also for the tourists visiting our area, because tourism is huge. And I do thank you for your time and look forward to maybe have, uh, coming back to you with data later this summer. Uh, Mr. Bieber. Thank you again, Madam Chairman. I know I get up here and I complain a lot, kind of I'm the thorn in your side, and I apologize for that. Um, my intentions are to try to make the community better as well. And when I drive around town, I'm not seeing things getting better. Uh, it seems like we're making poverty and crime and mental diagnoses systemic. You look at our county data, look at it, the results of what you are producing. Do you think they're good? I mean, we have some of the highest incarceration rates, some of the highest child abuse rates, some of the highest substance abuse rates. I mean, are those good things? But we're just gonna continue to status quo. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what the state tells us. Huh, do you represent the state or the constituents? Well, maybe you should start representing the county, making things better for here. You know, you act like you're a sovereign board. You know, like there's no consequences. You can threaten the public. You know, say you're gonna arrest them for not wearing a mask, or say, ooh, there's a snake in your water, but maybe there isn't, but maybe there is. We'll find out today, maybe, hopefully. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, Grover the Titans is a good indicator of how we do things now. You know, we're gonna put in this great trail, right? Attract all these people. And we're gonna forget about how they're gonna get in and out. I mean, we keep putting the cart in front of the horse. We can't even build a railroad anymore. You know, we don't have the energy infrastructure to put wind turbines in the ocean. All right, so let's start with the foundation. Let's stop dealing with the consequences and, deal, and start dealing with the problem. So I'm not sure 
why I get up here and say anything. It seems like I'm just ignored, but you know, the 101, 199, definite concerns. I'd like to know what we're doing about it to get it done. Are we just gonna watch it and pay salaries to watch it? You know, you're part of the resource conservation in Smith River. You work with the Smith River Collaborative. I mean, they're known to change the facts, maybe, right? To their, so they can get funded again. So I just encourage you to be influential, try to improve our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beaver. Any other public comments? Yes, sir. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, my name is James O'Shaughnessy. I'm a 39-year resident homeowner in Gaskey. I have served as the commander of the American Legion Post about eight years ago for a couple of years. It's been, been traditional to turn it over to somebody else after a two-year period. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all heard that phrase, there's no law north of the Klamath. Well, I would like to think that those days are over. Uh, it's very important to me, from my principles, that we abide by all laws. And uh, dang it, you know, it's uh, one of the first things I did when I became commander is I invited the highway patrol to come up here to the uh, Gaffke Raspberry thing to kind of tone down the alcohol problems and belligerent behavior. It was very effective. They also had great cooperation from Sheriff Apperson. He did an outstanding job. But uh, <coughs> I've also been lectured about, you know, you guys could lose everything. And you officers of the Legion, you could be sued and you could lose everything with one tragic incident. So it's important, we're trying to make the changes. We have uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Cooper as our judge advocate, uh, the new district attorney, uh, uh, Robin, she's on board and uh, we would greatly appreciate your help so that we can comply with the law. Because I'm not an attorney, but if you don't have a county permit, your insurance isn't gonna cover you. Thank you for your time. I found this a very interesting and enlightening meeting and I learned quite a few things. Good day. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Any other public comments? Mr. Powell, you don't wanna get up? No, okay. All right, so seeing no other public comments, I'm going to close the public comment period um, and we will move on now to our 10.30 timed item which is the Chamber of Commerce and a Visitor Bureau's marketing update with um, the lovely Cindy Vosberg, who is the Chamber Director. Ms. Vosberg and Ms. Braylord, welcome. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for having us here. I'm Cindy Vosberg with the Chamber and the Del Norte Visitor Bureau and Lynette Braylord with Lublish Design, our agency of record. And we're here to give you our annual report and we have it in a little different format this time. We have a video. Get ready.
Get ready. gave us um, some additional spending, some additional budget to use, and that helped push us up over another milestone of what we could accomplish with it. Lynette has done a great job with us this year. Uh, we've been reaching out to all of our partners, and it's showing. The other thing that's helped a great deal is COVID, for the most part, is behind us. And the travel riders are out again, and we have a beautiful story to tell here. So do you have any questions for us? Board members? No real questions, no, just amazing presentation. Um, maybe if we could slow down a little bit. There was a lot of information <laughs> there. That was really impressive. Good work. And Lynette has everything um, in hard copy that she'll share with you as well. She does an annual report for us. And in three months, we have another report for so the- So I will wrap up, because this is actually only March 1st of 2022 through the end of, uh, or March 1st, 2023. So technically, this is just an annual year in review. We still have numbers coming in through the end of the fiscal year, June 30th, and we have more travel riders coming, more stuff we're promoting. So we'll have more updates in the actual fiscal year annual report for you, and it'll be hard copy. So, so we'll briefly tell them about the next travel rider with the electric van. Oh my gosh, so very exciting. I don't know if you guys know about the Redwoods Hostel and Spa that's opening in Del Norte County. Um, I just found out today at a breakfast meeting with a local, and um, it's a very cool, it's going to be a really high-end hostel experience, um, and they've actually brought in um, water and a rock from the Dead Sea and Dead Sea salt, and they're doing this like big giant spa soaking tub. They're enclosing it, making it a very like tropical experience, like we're talking like giant uh, slugs, the yellow slugs there, and all this kind of stuff. Not live ones. Not live ones. Yeah. Oh, it's it's going to be kind of like a, a, a Alice in Wonderland kind of experience. Um, however, really excited. It's going to be opening in June. It's perfect timing because I've been in conversations via our relationship with Visit California that we've built. Um, we have a writer from Outside Magazine who's coming in his electric van and I'm going to put him there for the night. So I'm going to be meeting with them next week So to go tour the facility. It's supposed to be open in June. So right. um, 
Anyways, but yeah, we have a couple more writers. We have a gal, a travel writer from the Midwest coming from Travel Awaits, which is a huge uh, Midwest travel publication following. Again, it's, it's come from our relationship with Visit California, so we're awaiting travel dates for her. Um, so, yeah. We have someone here next week. Yeah, we have Bill Cleveland, who I included in the presentation. He's from Los Angeles. He's coming up here, um, and I didn't even mention, he's doing a complimentary video for us while he's here that he's going to also be pitching out to all of his, um, you know, his publications that he works for and broadcasting companies. So um, we'll have more to report in the next couple Supervisor months. Howard. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this presentation. Both Lynette, you and Cindy are doing a bang-up job when it comes to marketing our community. And having seen where we were back in the early 2000s to where we are today, it's really about that foresight that other boards and other city councils have had to know or feel good about the investment we are making with those public dollars. And that's really what this presentation is about today. You had a, the slide up there very quickly, but what you did show and what resonates well with this board is the 22% return on transient occupancy tax. That's, that's a big deal, right? Because we don't nearly put in that much into this compared to other communities like Humboldt or Curry north of us. You know. we're, we're, we for so many, many years, we had a redwood curtain that existed. And like the conversation during public comment today, you know, we, we saw the increases and the impacts on Howland Hill Road long before the Grove of the Titans went in. That was the, basically what the state park had told us. And so we know the visitations are increasing. We're able to capture that dollar here. And that dollar generally affects our general fund. It allows us to put the dollars towards things like law enforcement that we all rely on here. And that's part of our general fund dollar. But that 22% return is a big deal. And you guys are, should be super proud of that number because that's what generates our confidence in you to make those appropriate marketing ventures that are going to put and continue to put Delnor County on the map. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Wilson, do you have anything? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a shame that years ago when that bed tax went in, it was designed to go in and, and, and supposed to fund much of what our chamber does to promote Delnor County, but unfortunately so small a portion of that gets actually pushed in to, to generate what Delnor County has the potential of being. And, uh, you know, you that social marketing uh, strategy is is so big today uh, it's it's huge um, you know being connected to the industry of, of tourism to Delnor County it is such a smallly tapped resource that we have yet to really uh, crack as much and and as as many jobs that we need and and the income that we have um, is so tied to the beauty that we have here in Delmar County and yet we have yet to really open it up to the world to see and to do and to provide the services that will be needed and necessary for them to to sustain their their travels to here um, but kudos to you for for what you've been able to do and hopefully with with the vision going forward and and the help that we we hope to bring to encourage that growth in tourism to Delmar County and the economic growth that that can bring to here um, by opening up the 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 access to things like the Grove of Titans and to our rivers and to our beaches and our oceans and provide them you know places to to visit and see the, what we're doing uh, hopefully out at Point St. George and and other places um, because I know the people are, want to come here and they want to see, and we're, we're seeing an increase in, in the uh, bed dollars, not only from our, you know, uh, hotels and motels, uh, we're seeing occu occupancy higher than it has been in the past for longer periods of time, stretching well beyond just the summer. And so it, it is encouraging to see. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just, I feel so fortunate. I get to be on the Visitor Bureau with you ladies and the Chamber of Commerce Board. Um, so I get to see this growth, at, you know, when you report out to us all the time. I do want to give some credit to Supervisor Howard for years ago having the vision for the Visitor Bureau and, and bringing that forward. Um, I feel like that was such a good vision and it's really coming to fruition and that's paying off. So um, just wanted Thank to you. bring that up. Um, I do appreciate the, the video. It was it was very well done. Um, but yeah, slow it down a little bit. I know we've told you last time, speed it up. Now we're going to slow it down. So we had a fit in five minutes. I know I kept telling them five minutes, keep it short, ladies. So I'm going to open it up to public. You had something else, Cindy? No. Okay, I'm going to open up to public comments now. So if you could stick around in case somebody has any questions. Thank you. Do you want us to stay here or over there? Just sit on down back. Okay. Any public comments with regard to this presentation? Hello, Mr. Durego. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up, uh, I didn't, it was going a little fast. I didn't see how many beds extra we booked. But 22% is going to be equated to inflation, a large deal. I've stayed at a local hotel. Once in a while, you're going to squabble with the old lady. And the hotel rates have gone up, you know, a great deal, you know, probably more than 22%. And you're going to see that in your occupancy tax uh, gain. A lot of that's inflation, and it's the lowest, and I do see the contributions the harbor makes, the city makes, the county makes every year, um, even though you're not a business. I'd, I'd been a member of the Chamber of Commerce before, and it made sense for me for a minute. Um, but um, it's the lowest paying industry in the United States. I don't know if you knew that. So a lot of us have worked these jobs um, on the holidays and watched the fireworks from parking lots. Um, the lowest paying industry, and when I go to the Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce, they find advertisements, maybe you'd like to check out one of our Airbnbs, you know. When I look at what homes are available to rent, I find usually zero, and I find a couple hundred on Realtor.com, they've been spiking here for the season, it was about 160. Uh, and I find like over 300 on Airbnb, you know, yeah, they make their probably average around $7,000 a month. Um, to rent one if you needed one. So, um, you know, the, the visitors will come. We have the Redwood National Park here and all. But it's always going to make the lowest paying industry in the United States of America. And it's, you know, pretty seasonal here. It's not like we have a cruise destination or anything. Um, I don't know what you're going to do about it, but I, I you know, there's, there's a, I'm a business owner, you know, I'm, well, I, I quit doing the week. I don't, I don't want to. You know, I, I don't serve tourists, I serve locals, so I didn't want to pay you guys the tax anymore. But, uh, but I served tourists before, you know, we have a little tie-dye shop there on South Beach and all. And I advise everybody, I say, go get a hot dog cart, go get something, go throw crab rings down on the pier, and don't go get a permit or anything, you know, if you can, uh, make a few bucks, you'll, you'll do all right for the summertime. But everybody, I don't know that the masses are prepared to reap what you guys are reaping in occupancy tax and that kind of thing. For the masses, it's a seasonal job that pays minimum wage. And, you know, a good way to balance this at this point is to start to see how you can get some of these Airbnbs to go over to um, regular rentals or go on the market for sale. Not everybody that voted for you guys, and certainly your average constituent, didn't make the investment that you guys made in the tourist industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drago. Any other public comment with regard to this? All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment. Thank you again for showing up here today and presenting to us. We always appreciate to see your lovely faces. Uh, thank you for having us. All right, talk to you later. All right, now we have our 1040 timed item, which is to conduct a public hearing and approve a minor subdivision of lands zoned Timberland Preserve Zone, MS 2302, adopt option two findings and conditions listed in the staff report as amended by the Del Norte County Planning Commission as requested by the planner. That's all it says is the planner. <laughs> Hello, Jacob, how are you? Good, good morning. Um, yeah, so what you have before you today is a minor subdivision of land zone TBZ. Um, just a short project description. Um, the parcel is 240 acres and is proposed to be split into uh, two 120 acre parcels. Um, so this subdivision originally stemmed from discovery of a violation of the Subdivision Map Act, which the term violation is 
just the, the term that's used in the Subdivision Map Act itself. It largely stemmed from what I believe to be a mistake. Um, the 240-acre parcel was mapped on two different assessors' pages, which is a large parcel, so it makes sense, but it was described in the original deed as one single parcel. Um, so Mr. Ward Stover with Stover Engineering, who's here today, was uh, the person that discovered the error uh, and referred Mr. Dreyfus over to the Planning Division to remediate um, the situation. Um, so pursuant to the Subdivision Map Act, a notice of violation was recorded on the property. Um, and Mr. Dreyfus is obviously pursuing the uh, proper subdivision process. Um, so the reason that this project is before you today um, is because Delmark County Code, as well as Government Code Section 5111 9.5 uh, requires that the Board of Supervisors approve any subdivision of TPZ, land, TPZ lands. Um, yeah, um, so just to go on to a couple of items of note, um, First of all, the par a parcel map waiver was granted by the Delmar County Planning Commission. Um, originally, that was not supported by staff, but given Ward Stover's comments, um, it was eventually approved by the Planning Commission, and there's a little bit more detail on that in the board report itself, as well as the minutes. Um, and then the second thing, Government Codes uh, 51119.5 requires recordation of a deed restriction on the parcel, uh, restricting uh, the property to provisions of a joint timber management plan uh, for a minimum of a 10-year period. Um, so that deed restriction has been recorded. This is the original document I have here before me in the file. Um, other than that, um, the project meets all the standards and regulations that Delmar County Code and state law require. Um, it's really a, a pretty simple project, um, and the Planning Commission as well as staff recommend approval of option two conditions as amended in the staff report. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, both myself and Ward Stover are here today to answer any of those. So, thank you. Does the board have any questions? No, no, not this time. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open up for public comment. Is there any public comments on this matter? With that, there are none. I will close public comments. And I entertain a motion. I move to approve the minor subdivisional land zone timber preserve zone and adopt the option two findings and conditions listed in the staff report. I'll second that. Okay, first by Supervisor Howard, a second by Supervisor Borges. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please pull the vote? Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. All right, we'll move on to our 1050 timed item, which is the review the county service areas, CSA financial position, current operating budget, and projection of financial needs for the next five years, and discuss and direct staff to work on a plan to grow revenue and initiate the Proposition 218 process as requested by the county engineer. Mr. Olson, welcome. All right. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for having me. Uh, what we're here today to talk about is uh, the CSA, which is our county service area, and what that is is the collection, sewer collection system, which is outside of the city jurisdiction. So basically sewer is collected, it's sent down to the city, it runs through their collection system, ultimately to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the county owns and or hires the city to operate the county's portion of that collection system. Uh, the financial situation over the past uh, few years has been that we've essentially run in a deficit or we're, our operational budget is right at um, um, the revenue that's generated uh, on an annual basis. Um, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant uh, through the state water board and it was the, uh, the easy kind of grant. It's a one pager, you send it in, push button, get banana. The, we, don't ha we don't have to hire anybody. The water board actually hires the consultant. So we've got uh, RDN here today and they're gonna present the findings and then we'll be happy to answer any questions or uh, hopefully get some direction from you at the end. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Does the board have any comments or questions? Seeing none, um, is there any public comments with regard to this? Are we? We should wait for the presentation. Yeah, we, we should, oh, I apologize. I we should have RDM uh, available online. Um, well, then we'll read you all of that after the presentation. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
This is Zach Van Dinter from RDN. Just making sure the uh, Board of Supervisors can hear me all right. Yeah. Uh, if it's all right, I'll, I'll share my screen. And if you all could just uh, confirm that you can see the screen, that would be great. Yes, yes. Excellent. All right, so by way of introduction, uh, I'm an economist here at RDN. Uh, my colleague, Anthony Olowski, is also on the line. Uh, the purpose of today's presentation, as John mentioned, uh, is to convey the results um, of the wastewater rate study for the Del Norte CSA1 service area, and then receive board direction uh, on next steps uh, in initiating the Proposition 218 process. Uh, so I have a short presentation here uh, that I'll run through, um, and then I'll, uh, John and I will be happy to field questions at the end. So I'll start off with the, the current rates uh, for the CSA1. Uh, so currently customers are billed on a per connection basis. Uh, currently there are just over 3,300 connections uh, in the service area. These are uh, customers are billed at a rate of $72 per year per connection. Uh, for a total annual revenue of about $240,000. Slide three here, we have our operating budget. Uh, so revenue is expected to stay constant at $240,000. Uh, you can see in 2023, your O&M op, uh, operating and maintenance expenses are uh, just below your operating revenue. Um, but in the uh, subsequent fiscal years, uh, starting in 2024, uh, due to inflating um, operating costs, uh, you'll begin to run a deficit. Uh, starting in 2024, uh, the deficit um, getting larger and larger uh, over the course of the 10-year uh, horizon, uh, thus demonstrating a need for uh, a revenue adjustment. So today we have uh, two financial plan options uh, to present to the board. Um, the uh, both options adequately fund your projected O and M expenses, and they also build a reserve balance of about five hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, which we'll discuss uh, more later. Uh, the difference between the two options is that option one uh, includes no additional capital improvement plan funding uh, or capital improvement project funding. Um, so with the with the current um, reserve balance that that we have planned uh, under option one. Um, we have two projects that are listed uh, that will be able to be executed with the funds that are available. Uh, the difference uh, in option two is that it provides 250,000 per year in capital funding. And you can see that uh, with that additional funding, uh, there are more uh, critical projects that can be uh, completed um, with, with that increase in funding. So let's get into the details of these two options. Um, so option one, as I mentioned, has no planned rate funded capital projects. Uh, there's also no current debt service payments made by the service area. And the current uh, cash reserve balance is about $143,000. So that's our, that's our starting balance for the study. Uh, our recommended reserve balance uh, includes two reserve funds. The first is an operating reserve. Uh, we recommend uh, maintain, maintaining a balance of six months of O&M expenses uh, by fiscal year 2028, uh, which is the end of our study period. Uh, that total is uh, expected to be about $150,000. The other reserve fund is a capital improvement fund. Uh, and this fund um, we recommend to make annual contributions to of about 50% of your depreciation expense. Uh, that comes out to be about $80,000 contributed to this fund per year. By fiscal year 2028, that brings your total reserve target up to about $550,000. Slide six, we have the status quo pro forma under this option one. Uh, this is with no revenue adjustments, so I'll just highlight the key numbers here. In the top left, you can see our starting cash uh, position is $143,000. Uh, if you look at uh, about the middle of the table, the net revenues, you can see uh, you're on a slight surplus in fiscal year 2023, 
uh, but then all five subsequent years uh, have a negative net operating revenue. Uh, such that the ending balance by 2028 uh, is a negative 22,000 uh, in cash. So to avoid running the deficit uh, into into negatives, we have uh, the recommended adjustments here on slide seven. Uh, the table at the top uh, shows the recommended revenue adjustments in each uh, of the five fiscal years of the study period, starting with a 20% revenue adjustment in fiscal year 2024. 15% in 2025, 10% in 2026, and 5% in the last two years of the study period. The figure on the bottom of this screen shows your ending cash balance or total available cash uh, at the end of each fiscal year. Uh, the blue bars represent the ending cash balance uh, should you follow this recommended adjustment schedule. Uh, once again, uh, resulting in your fiscal year 2028 uh, reserve target of about $548,000. And you can see without a revenue adjustment, uh, your ending cash balance will follow the gray bar trajectory down to minus $22,000. Here's that pro forma again, but this time uh, it includes the revenue adjustments uh, we described on the last slide. Uh, you see the big difference here. Uh, if you look at uh, the rate revenue uh, line, you can see that that increases over the study period uh, due to those revenue adjustments. Uh, and your ending cash balance, the green box in the bottom right, you can see reaches your uh, proposed reserve target of about $548,000 by the end of the study period. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so let's see how uh, the rates look as a result of those revenue adjustments. So as I mentioned, uh, currently each connection uh, pays $72 per year uh, for their sewer fees. Um, following a 20% adjustment in 2024, that would increase to 8640. And then you can see the resulting rates, uh, assuming that the uh, recommended rate uh, revenue adjustment schedule is followed. Um, by the fifth year, fiscal year 2028, the annual bill uh, per connection would be at $120.50. Uh, the second row in this table shows the annual increase. Uh, so the fiscal year 2024 annual increase is $14.40 per connection. That comes out to $1.20 uh, per month increase in, in sewer bill. Uh, cumulatively, over the five years, uh, the monthly increase uh, in sewer bill per connection is just over $4. All right, we'll switch gears here to option two. And once again, the difference between option one and option two is this planned rate-funded capital projects. Option two includes $250,000 per year in rate-funded uh, capital funding. Uh, once again, no debt service payments, uh, and the reserve uh, current reserve balance is once again $143,000. Option two recommends the same reserve policy, uh, leading to the reserve target of $548,000 once again. So under this plan and no rate adjustments, uh, you can see that the ending balance uh, quickly becomes um, very, very negative, uh, past one point, uh, over a million dollars in the red by the end of the study period. Uh, so once again, to ensure that the service area covers its O&M expenses uh, and is able to execute uh, some capital projects uh, to the tune of 250,000 per year, uh, the recommended adjustments are as follows. Uh, for fiscal year 2024, recommended adjustment would be 75%, followed by 35% in 2025, 20% in 2026, followed by 7% in 27, and 6% in the final year of the study. The figure on the bottom of the screen here, once again, shows the ending cash balance each fiscal year. Uh, the blue bars represent the ending cash balance uh, following these recommended adjustments, uh, where the gray bars recommend, uh, I'm sorry, the, the gray bars represent the ending cash balance uh, without a revenue adjustment. 
So here's the proposed pro forma under the option two adjustments. Uh, you can see the difference here um, is the capital expenditure row uh, towards the bottom uh, includes 250,000 adjusted for inflation uh, per year um, in capital expenditures. Um, and, and this funding is intended to uh, complete some uh, needed projects uh, within the service area. And once again, the ending balance at the end of the five years is around your uh, recommended reserve target of $550,000. Let's see the result uh, of option two revenue adjustments on the rates. So once again, currently billed at $72 per connection uh, with that 75% revenue adjustment uh, would bring the annual bill per connection to $126. That's an annual increase of $54 per year, or a monthly increase of $4.50. Um, by the fifth year, fiscal year 2028, uh, the per connection annual bill would be $231.51. Uh, cumulatively, uh, option two uh, would, would have a monthly increase of just over $13 uh, over the five years um, in each connection's monthly bill. All right, my last slide here, slide 15, uh, just shows those uh, proposed rates um, over time here. So currently rates are $72 per connection. Uh, and then you can see the uh, trajectory uh, should you follow the option one uh, re recommended adjustments or the option two. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd be happy to revisit anything, uh, any questions from the Board of Supervisors. Um, any any questions or or concerns for me? Thank you. Hey, th thanks a lot, Zach. Uh, I'd just like to make make three points. Uh, the first point is uh, the rates that we're talking about here are uh, assessed on your tax bill, and these are separate from the rate payers' monthly bill. So we're not talking about the bill that folks are used to getting from their from the city for their water and sewer. This is a totally separate bill that's, that you pay with your taxes each year if you're in the assessment district. So that's the first point I want the public to be well aware of and the, and the board also. Uh, the other two points, uh, option one, I would call that the bare bones minimum fiscally responsible thing to do and that is just status quo. We're just barely skating by and we're piling up a little bit of cash so that if we have something really go wrong, we can hopefully fix it within a half a million dollars. Some of you know how far half a million goes when we have deep underground work, it's not very far. So that's option one is bare, bare, bare bones minimum. Option two, I would say is, uh, is, is not a very conservative approach. It's still like, we're just doing a little bit better. We're gonna invest a quarter million a year uh, one example that I'll give uh, is just to do an assessment of all of our underground sewer lines is about 800,000. That means we're taking a camera, running it through all the miles of lines that we have and getting that inspection and understanding fully the condition of our underground collection system, along with looking at all those manholes individually. So that I hope that helps uh, folks understand kind of, that's just our baseline. If I invest 800,000, so I save up for three years and then I can, you know, pull the trigger, let's, let's go on that project, then I'll know even more where our system is. So option one, bare bones, just status quo, plus a little buffer. Option two, let's think about the future a little bit. All right, now is there questions from the board? Okay, we'll go ahead and supervise the Uh Just have a question on, you know, the status quo on options. Um, you have it for 23, 24, 25, all the way through as zero rate increase on option one. Does that implying that we have no new connections? Why is that never changing for the next whatever many years? Yeah, that's the, the number of connections will be very modest. Uh, so, I mean, even, even if you said, let's, let's do 100 connections, you know, times 72 bucks. So, it's, you know, that's a, it's not very much money. Uh, so, that, so, that's a modest. And what's, what's included approach. in the operating expense? 
The operating expense is, is largely uh, electricity. That's about between thirty and forty-five thousand dollars per year, depending upon how wet it is, how much we have to pump. Um, and then the biggest chunk of the expense is the money that we actually pay to the city of Crescent City. We're under contract with the city to operate and maintain our, our lift stations and sewer collection system. So if there's a blockage, they go out and jet it. If there's an issue at any of our lift stations, their, their technicians are the ones that go down and generally handle it. If it's a bigger issue, sometimes we have to hire a contractor. Uh, but for the day-to-day -day operation and maintenance, generator checks, all those, all those types of things. Um, even if there's a, like a pass-through, for example, um, the city will hire Cummings or some other contractor to come in, service all the generators, city and county, and then we ultimately pay the bill. But it's, if we were to look at it in the budget line, you'll just see that as a bill from the city of Crescent City for operation and maintenance of the collection system. Uh, maybe a side note different from this, why is the county even involved in the sewer system if we're hiring the city to do everything? That, it's, a, it's a great question. In fact, uh, LAFCO over the past 10 years plus has recommended uh, not just for the, the CSA but also for the water districts that we have uh, that those should be consolidated. So I, I, think it, I think it's a great question. Uh, I'd love to broach that uh, or explore that f uh, further. Uh, all I have for now. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Wilson, do you have anything now or would you like to wait till after public comment? Okay. So at this point, I'm going to um, open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on this item number 17? Mr. Bieber. I apologize, Madam Chair, for being up here again. Um, yeah, everything's getting more expensive, right? You go to the grocery store or um, Redwood Coast Transit, sewer connections, you, any utilities can get expensive. Rates are going up, but why? Why is everything going up? Why do we got inflation? Well, I'd like to point out it's probably because of the policy that you approve. You know, this budget, Donald's budget, is the reason why we're in crazy inflation. Just listen to some of these numbers and how the budgets have increased in the last two years. CYA budget, cover your ass, I don't, what is CYA, anybody, what is CYA? California Youth Authority. Youth Authority, thank you. From 7,000 to 35,000. Um, environmental health, from 323,000 323, to 497,000, a 53% increase in two years. Home key, went from 2.2 million to 2.9 million, a 32% increase. Mental health services went from 3.1 million in 2020 to 12.84 million, four times the amount it was in two years ago. Mental health, 6.1 million to 11.2 million. Bioterrorism, 121,000 to 284,000, more than doubled. Welfare assistance, 16 million to 21 million. H1N1, 46,000 to 111, more than doubled. A lot of cases of the H1N1 now. Hospital preparedness, we're paying Sutter to improve the hospital, 100,000 to 276,000. Emergency medical procedures from 25,000 to 300,000. For health, 2.7 million to 7.19 million. Welfare admin from 12.6 million to 17.7 million. Housing didn't have a budget line a couple of years ago. It's now 1.28 million. SNAP for food, 1.28 million. It's now at 1.84 million. WIC went from $31,000 a couple years ago to $600,000 this year. Just hired another person today, so that's going up. You're creating problems. 
Thank you, Mr. Bieber. Any other public comments? Great. With that, I will close public comments. Mr. Howard, or Supervisor Howard. Whatever you want to do, it's all good. I know who you're talking about. So, John, if you could come back up, please. The um, obviously, you, staff needs direction on what to do. Obviously, we've kicked the can down the road a long time to get in a situation where we're not looking at what a deficit looks like in repair costs associated with it. Obviously, LAFCO's tried to make some suggestions, and for whatever reason, the CSAs haven't transferred. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nobody wants an ugly albatross to pay for over a long term period of time. We need some we need to do something about it. Yep. How do we do something about it? Is it you said you started the conversation, you didn't go all the way with it. <laughs> How is this done? So uh, ideally the recommendation from from LAFCO is that the city would take over uh, those CSAs. Or, or water districts, and, and I'll focus it towards the sewer system and today. Can you explain the two, we have two CSAs. Can yes. you explain where those two CSAs Yeah, so the, the two CSA areas, one is what you would call Birch to Ocean View area, and the other one is North, uh, North Crest area, so basically north of Washington and, and that service area. Um, so those are, those are the two CSAs. Um, then, Ideally, or what was recommended is that both of those areas, although they all fall under one, our, our jurisdiction currently, is that those would be turned over to the city and that the city would take ownership uh, and operation and maintenance of those. So they're already doing the operation and maintenance, it's just a matter of us collecting money and passing it through to the city to pay for it and then uh, whatever grants or things we go after for capital improvements, which we're always seeking uh, for the CSA. Um, so that, that would be a long-term solution. I'm sure that, uh, well, having sat at the city, I know that there's some uh, resistance to that because if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna take on a system, uh, it's great if it's brand new, but uh, our system is not brand new. And so, you know, maybe, maybe I would take it if you gave me that plus a hundred million dollars or something like that. You know? uh, but, but what's reasonable for the community would be to have that uh, more consolidated and just have one administration handling all of that uh, that would that would mean only one water board permit instead of multiple water board permits in our community so uh, in the long term that's definitely a direction or uh, a direction that we should be going a uh, consolidation currently also the water board has uh, funds available and they they want to see communities consolidate too they're tired of dealing with multiple permits in a, in the county when hey why why don't i just have one point of contact sure. from this from the state so there's a number of uh, number of grants available right now to help fund some of those consolidations usually they're based on uh, i believe it's a per connection fee so however many connections you have three you know 3300 and then so many dollars per each connection and that dollar amount changes depending upon what year it is. Um, and so <coughs> to piggyback off of those comments, when you write the words 218 on here, the word taxes come to mind and mm -hmm. whether or not taxes are permanent or temporary. Right. So explain that piece of the equation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to rely on the economist in the room to, to help me better understand it because I am an engineer, not an economist, <laughs> and uh, some of those words were confusing for me, so uh, maybe I'll bring Zach in and he can help clarify that. Yeah, because this is something, and if you could go into, this is something that goes before the voters in the CSA because this is not something that we as a board can levy ourselves to the CSA, is that, that correct? That's correct, you'd be making a recommendation and then um, then it, it could be um, voted down essentially. Correct. So, yep. yep. Zach, this is Zach. Go ahead. Oh, John, happy to piggyback off that a little bit. Um, so yeah, so the purpose of, of today's meeting would be to um, receive board direction or, or board approval of a specific option um, uh, that would uh, allow us to move forward with the 218 process, which is a public hearing. Uh, and there is 
an extensive process involved in that. Um, there's a, a mailer that needs to be sent out to all parcel owners. Um, and then the public hearing is held uh, no, no sooner than 45 days after that mailer is uh, distributed. Um, and then at the public hearing, uh, there's a, a opportunity for ratepayers to protest. And if 50% plus one of ratepayers uh, submit a valid protest, the, the rates would not pass. Supervisor Wilson. Yeah, this is a an issue that you know we're we're all dealing with, and and we're dealing with it not just in in this service district, but in all phases of, of county government. And that is, you know, when we have duties and responsibilities to maintain and 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 keep up these systems that are built, and as we've neglected these systems for years. Unfortunately, um, it falls on us to make choices like this. And, you know, I would uh, support and approve of, of going forward with the change that allows us to not only meet, you know, our, our revenue stream so that, but also one that builds up a, a sum of money to deal with the needs and the and the upkeep of this system uh, it's not getting any younger and and it has not had the attention that it needs and 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 things are not going to get less expensive I can guarantee you um, it's going to be a hard pill to swallow for those that are within these districts I know um, and maybe we have to moderate this request to be less bold in its in its uh, um, asking, but it, it definitely is something that we need to have in the long term planning out. I mean, I'd love to see the unification of the service district under one banner, um, but I know the objections that the city has had in the past of absorbing you know, such an area outside of their jurisdictional boundaries. And so I, I, I understand that, you know, you don't want the headaches and none of the rewards. So uh, it's, it is, a, it is a, a pill that we'll have to deal with and swallow. Um, but I, I see the need for us to have this change that allows us to not only meet our expenses so that we're not going into a deficit and having to reach out in other areas to pay for this service, but also to build up a reserve so that we can take care of the infrastructure that that is within our confines to, to deal with. Uh, we have to have the resources to keep and maintain these, these county uh, resources that are necessary and needed to be servicing these districts. You hate to see the increases, but that's unfortunately the, the where we've gone to at this point in time. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. So at this point, does the board have a direction or what would be proposed? I guess here's some, here's some thoughts on this. Um, having wrestled with this and advocated for the city's expansion of, of wastewater treatment back in the mid 2000s, 05, 06, I know it was a, a significant goal of the cities because basically they were under a cease and desist from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board for a period of over a decade. Um, obviously, they had to go out with a tax, tax measure. It was protested, but eventually they did get a wastewater treatment facility, which allowed for some growth, really, uh, hookups, businesses to hook up to a system. They couldn't do it. They were frozen in time without that infrastructure piece. This could be a very similar circumstance here with the CSAs, specifically Birch Ocean View, specifically with the area along Elk Valley Road, which is zoned pretty much for light manufacturing areas, areas that we're looking at today, but in addition along Northcrest, which this area services. So um, I guess my question to you, John, um, as we potentially give you direction today, you know, Prop, the two, Prop 218 process you know, as you're having these planning discussions, that's a 
to me, a last resort potentially. What I'd like to do is have some uh, more broadly based discussions with the departments, but in particular administration, and how measure R might tie into this with specifically uh, critical, the critical infrastructure piece language in measure R to see if that is a tool that we could soften the blow with taxpayers. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely an opportunity. Um, one, of the, one of the things just that I would expect to hear from citizens is that uh, Measure R being a general tax and the sewer, the sewer fund being essentially, you know, a, and a set aside mm -hmm. that only serves specific districts while there may be some wider community benefit, you know, from increased business or denser residential. Um, it's the users that are essentially paying the fee. And so uh, using general tax revenue is for user specific fees or services is, is one of the reasons that people, I mean, I don't use the sewer, why would I pay? <laughs> uh, but but I, I, it's definitely something that it's within the boundaries of Measure R, uh, so we could certainly discuss that further. In the in the CSA statute, it says that the board can loan the CSA general fund dollars, and can eventually forgive it if it wants. But it would be like every year, you're making a loan by four fifths vote, and then forgiving hmm. it. Um, with separate votes for the exact kind of reason that CS some some kinds have lots of CSAs and so you you wouldn't want your general taxpayers to have money going in there that they don't have any say over but the board does have the, the capacity to do that vote yeah well the city had to my point of this and I think you're getting it the city had to make a clear vision to make the investment mm -hmm. to get the returns that they're seeing now and uh, they've clearly seen the returns with growth of business within yeah. the city limits Similarly, we could do the same thing with the CSA. With appropriate investment, we could see some of that growth. And I'd like nothing better to polish that turd up, <laughs> no pun intended, and, and allow them to have a brand new piece to move forward with and, yeah. and adopt it through the LAFCO process. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say is that staff, in way before my arrival with the county, has been incredibly diligent in seeking and obtaining grants for needed infrastructure projects throughout the CSA, like our mo most recently our um, system control and data acquisition, which is our remote viewing system for the entire system. That alone has saved operational costs. It's helped us do preventative maintenance earlier before things get to failure. So the county has done, uh, has not totally ignored the system. Staff has done a wonderful job of, of attacking that, but we haven't seen a rate in increase since, I believe, 1981. Yep. That was my question. Yep. So, Too long. thank you. Okay, so where do we want to go? Well, it's really uh, District 4 over here. And I know. <laughs> but I'd like to really hear from you two. I mean, these, this is your constituents that we're really talking about here, so. One point of clarification, is it the CSA one or is it both, there's two CSAs that you're talking about? Yeah, those were those are really just uh, a s different assessment districts that were tied to specific improvements in each of those districts. Okay. Those bonds have essentially been paid off, so the, the county is the CSA. Okay. And so uh, we can talk about the districts being different, but essentially they're the same. Uh, there's there's one minor discrepancy, and that's about the rate that's paid. One one area is 78, the other is 72. I'd like to see that normalized, and if we move forward with this process, that's what that's what you would see is more of a normalized rate there. So. Great, thank you, Supervisor Wilson. I'm sorry. And and this increase, um, that's from that's not just outside of city limits, right? That's everyone that's connected to the sewer would see this increase. This this is only. This is only in the county only areas. So you can throw that if you can throw yeah, that map up again. Map. Yeah. That would be great. So so we're increasing the rates for the people in these certain areas outside of the city limits. Outside city right? limits, yes. And we're still responsible for all the improvements inside the city limits? We are not we're only responsible for improvements outside city limits. But the city will then charge us for any improvements the inside the city limits or yeah so outside? the city this for example let's say that the city wanted to raise 
wastewater rates, that would cover everybody inside and outside city limits. What we're talking about now is only for assessment district one, assessment district uh, two. So those, those areas, county only areas, doesn't include city limits. I hope that, I hope that clarifies. Okay. Supervisor Wilson, did you have something? I'm sorry. And that assessment is to the parcels, correct? That is to the parcels. So you see that on their tax bill. Yep. Yeah, one of, one of the reasons we were looking at a six month operation budget instead of, uh, as a reserve, instead of three months, which, which would be more typical, is because you only get paid every six months. We only get paid every six months. And so it makes sense to hold a little bit more in reserve. And, and it's a very nominal amount, $150,000. So. so my question is, is so this prop, 218, it could still get voted down by the public. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, so if we decide to go forward with something today, mm -hmm. either option one, option two, mm -hmm. or status quo, um, the public could speak and, and mm -hmm. vote this down. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and then my job in some ways becomes easier because I don't have any money to work with, but it becomes more <laughs> difficult. <laughs> It becomes more difficult in that now we're going to spend more time, more and more time looking at grants and, hey, what are our other options? How else, what else can we do to, to make things happen? Okay. And where did the 550 target come from for the reserves target? Why that magic number? It's a good question. So what, what we looked at was um, just a, a really nominal type reserve. So. You need to have some budget available, but, but how much is that budget? So we said, well, our current, our current depreciation is, uh, we're depreciating at about 160,000 a year. Uh, normally, I would be setting 100% of that away. You know, hey, I gotta replace the roof in 30 years. Let's start placing that money in the box. We're taking a, a kind of a reduced approach and saying, well, let's just take 50% of our estimated <coughs> depreciation and let's start setting that away. So when you, when you look at that, that's the, the 80,000 over uh, five years plus uh, the 150 reserve fund. So that's where you get to about 550,000. Is there, so the rate increase on the proposed annual option one, um, I think the first year comes out to $14 a year. And um, it seems, nobody wants increases, but that seems more reasonable. Um, is there a way to modify the the 550 and then also, you know, maybe lessen that number, or take a little longer to get there, mm -hmm. but also set aside money in the reserves to do the improvements? Because um, I believe it was option one was no improvements, mm -hmm. reserves. Option two was improvements and reserves. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask Zach to bring, bring those slides up, and then I'll ask Zach to speak to that a little bit. And and show you, just relook at those projections, um, and then maybe we can get a little bit better answer. Certainly. Um, so the, the short answer to your question is uh, yes. Um, this this reserve target that we have uh, over the course of five years um, is, is our recommendation. Um, uh, for those reasons that that John mentioned there, um, but if if this is you know deemed to be uh, too aggressive, uh, we can re either reduce that percentage that's contributed every year, um, or take longer. We can take ten years uh, to get to this balance of five hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so that can be adjusted to uh, something that that is more more palatable to uh, to the board and and to the public. And would that by reducing that, maybe that portion of it, that would give us funds to still do some improvements? You, like if we kept the rates the same and said, we're only gonna, at, at the end of five years, I'm gonna have a capital balance of 250,000, that would, that would give me 300,000 to spend over the next five years. If Which we is not very much. <clears throat> yeah, not very much. Okay. So that, that means in about 10 years, I would be able to do the complete condition assessment of the entire system. You know, 
camera every single one, look for all the defects, prioritize those, and then you know, ex assuming we get no other there. funding or grants exactly. for these type of projects, yep. which historically they're out there. there. There's been grants out there. It's been really hit and miss um, between some about four hundred thousand in ARPA funding that were, that's been dedicated last year, plus uh, there was an, uh, a Proposition One grant. Uh, and I think that was about 800,000, so about 1.2 million in this past year that we'll be expending over this year, partially in the next fiscal year. Hopefully we'll expend it all next fiscal year uh, for a generator project. But the, the issues are, as is often occurs, grants are for the unsex, or grants are for sexy projects like new generators, new systems, big improvements, that's what people like. Uh, grants typically don't fund operation and maintenance and that's really, when I, when I said option one is like that bare bones, like this is just what we need in reserve, just in case we have a, a problem. Uh, that's where I would feel comfortable, so. Um, so grants, generally those better projects, they just don't fund operation and maintenance that often. So, but with that, <coughs> option two says to install generators at all lift stations. Aren't we already funded for that? Yeah, we're, we're partially funded for that. I would not say that we're fully funded. We're going through the design process right now, and uh, depending upon how that fleshes out, uh, we'll, we'll see how many generators we can uh, purchase. Okay, so. and so if it requires more, is can we adjust our ARPA contribution toward that? So I don't know, I feel like option two, we could probably figure out a way to do a compromise. Um, I, I believe that Zach has one, one other option that's maybe more of a, a midway. And, All right, let's um, see it, Zach. Zach, why don't you show us that? <laughs> <laughs> why did he lead with that? Yeah. <laughs> Why'd you leave that one hey, out? Hey, hey, honest, <laughs> honestly, I thought two choices were enough. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll let, I'll let Zach give you, give you this, middle, this middle ground option which we prepared in anticipation. So. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you. So we had a, an option three here in case it was necessary. Um, this looks to find a uh, middle ground between option one and option two. Um, so this provides 125,000 of rate funded uh, capital funding each year throughout the study period. Uh, all other uh, parts of the analysis, the starting cash balance and the uh, reserve target recommendation remain the same. Uh, I'll pass that one and let's go straight to the financial plan here. So the recommended adjustments there, um, you kind of strike right in between uh, what's proposed for option one and option two. Uh, it's a 50% revenue adjustment in the first year, followed by 25% in 2025. 15% in 2026, and 7% and 6% in the final two years of the study. Uh, you can see, once again, the uh, the blue bars represent the ending cash balance with that revenue adjustment. Uh, once again, striking your reserve target of about $550,000 by the end of the study period. Let's take a look at how that affects, so first we'll see the pro forma here. Um, so thing to note here is capital expenditure row. Uh, it includes 125,000 per year adjusted for inflation. Uh, and you can see once again, the green box in the bottom right, that ending balance uh, just above your reserve target, $550,000. Uh, that impact on the rates um, brings your uh, proposed rate for fiscal year 2024 up to $108 per year. That's an annual increase of $36 uh, on top of the current $72. Um, and then by the end of the study period, fiscal year 2028, the annual bill would be $176.08. Um, so I haven't done the math on this one, but the monthly increase there looks to be uh, about seven or $8 uh, per month, uh, cumulatively over the five years. Uh, and then here, just to leave off with the uh, rate comparison between uh, options one, two, and three, uh, right in the middle there. I'll turn that back over to, to the Board of Supervisors. 
thank Zach for preparing a middle option also. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, what do you? So how do you feel about option three, John? Does that serve yeah. any of your purposes or is that just we're not really doing anything at all. You, it, well, it, it gets us closer, but it's still not there. It's just like option one, still that bare bones. Option two is like better than bare bones. And, and I just feel it's, it's a compromise in between, you know? So it doesn't hurt as much uh, for the rate payers, um, but it also in the long run, it doesn't accomplish our goals as quickly. So maybe I, instead of waiting with option one, maybe I have to wait or I'm sorry, with option two, I have to wait three years to get my condition assessment done. With option, this last option, now I'm looking at five or six years before I'd have the funds set aside to do, um, to do that condition assessment or look at borrowing in the near term and then doing some debt service, uh, you know, paying, paying back that lo loan uh, over time, so which would be a, another way of getting the work done sooner. I, I like to save up cash and pay for it. Uh, that's just personal philosophy, uh, but I, I totally understand debt servicing and trying to accomplish your goals earlier, so. I guess my, my kind of pushback or thought on it is, you know, we can guide you in a direction, but this is gonna go to the voters to mm -hmm. vote. Um, so if you, in my feeling, if you want a chance of this passing, I think option three is probably where I would lean. Okay. Okay. It, yeah, I agree with that. Also, it just is, especially considering the, the areas that we're talking about, you know, uh, for the majority of these are not uh, affluent areas. And, you know, they're you know, not saying that a lot of these people may be renting as opposed to owning. Uh, mm -hmm. So the property owners may be somewhere, someone else. Uh, but, um, but that is much easier to absorb option three than it is. And, and I can see more likely to pass okay. than, than the option two. All right, so I think that you have some direction. Okay, so what, what we'll do is we'll uh, continue to work with um, our consultant uh, and we'll get, get a public hearing posted and, and bring, bring this back uh, as soon as possible. Great, so thank you, Mr. Olson. Hey, I really appreciate your consideration on this matter, and uh, middle option sounds great. Okay. <laughs> so with that, we're getting we're approaching two hours. I'd like to take a five-minute break, if that is okay with the board. Yes, it is okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for allowing that brief break. So we are going to move on to our 11 o'clock timed item and get a presentation from Smith River Community Service District Water Quality Report, Mr. Jeff Beard. I've not met you officially yet, so it's nice to meet you. Morning. Uh, well, almost afternoon now. Um, so yeah, like you said, I'm just coming here to share some results. Um, I wanted to start off today by saying that I'm not here to sway anybody's decision on any of this mine stuff. Um, I'm just strictly here to discuss the test results and ways that we could possibly avoid any sort of negative thoughts or comments or anything like that in the future um, when this stuff comes up. Uh, the Smith River CSD has been testing up for arsenic in the water for the past 30 years. Um, they've tested nine times in those 30 years. Um, only one of those times did we actually get a positive test result for arsenic. Um, every other time it's been non-detect. Uh, so that test result um, was in 2019. It measured out at 2.9 parts per billion. Uh, the MCL, our maximum contamination uh, limit, uh, put out by the EPA and also um, the California Water Res Resources Control Board is 10 parts per billion. So about a quarter. Um, and that was the highest it's ever been and the only time that it's actually ever shown up in our system. <coughs> um, there were a few other contaminants brought up at the meeting on March 28th, one of them being copper, the other one being chromium. Uh, chromium has always been non-detect throughout the entire history of the district. Uh, copper is a little bit of a different situation. Uh, I know one of the people that made comment at that meeting had brought up copper. Uh, all copper testing is done at the customer's house taps from inside the house, so they're not considered part of source water. Um, there's a ton of different variables that can come into that. Um, so one, we rely on the customer to be taking these test results. I've never been a huge fan of it, but that's just the way that the programs be set up for as long as I've been in the water industry. Um, Two of them could be, or another reason could be um, that there's, you know, bad old pipes in there in the ground. There's a six to eight hour waiting period that you're supposed to let that water sit in the pipes. Um, that could also, if it, it's been longer than that, um, it could also lead to a higher test result. Uh, for instance, we have test results for copper and lead that come back uh, on First Street. For instance, I've got one that's at one address and it rated way up off of the top of the scale, way above what the regulations or limits are. And then two, two houses down, um, it's at like 17, you know, versus 2,200 at the other. Uh, so a lot of these bad copper test results that, that you see in our CCR are actually um, results of from coming from the customer's tap. Um, but the last time that we did test our source water coming in for copper, uh, it was three parts per billion. Um, the state limit is, or the state and the EPA limit is 1,300 parts per billion. So our source water doesn't have any copper really to speak of coming, coming into the system. Okay, so what year was that? Or that you 2019. 2019 was yeah, that. Yeah, I think you guys actually have a copy of those test results <coughs> that has all the arsenic and the different heavy metals. Um, there's a lot to go over on all of this stuff. So um, I'm trying to keep it short, but also let everybody know that if there are any concerns or anybody wants to know more about copper testing, arsenic testing, anything like that, they can always reach out to the district and get a hold of me. So, um, so on to basically what we can do in the future to avoid any negative articles being written about the district. Um, concerns that the community has, uh, it's pretty easy, just communicate with us. Um, when, prior to the meeting um, on the 28th, nobody reached out to the district or me. Um, absolutely nobody. And if somebody, anybody, would have just came in and asked for our test results, I feel like the community wouldn't have been as concerned or worried about it. Um, I wasted a lot of time on phone calls, chasing down data. I did bring a sample down to Eureka to get tested. Um, so uh, there was a lot of footwork that had to take place, you know, over the last month um, that could have been easily avoided if somebody would just reached out to us. So 
what I'm going to ask, basically, and I know I spoke with uh, I spoke with Darren already about this. Um, so, if there's any future agendas, board meetings, anything having to do with Rowdy Creek or any of its tributaries, uh, ask that the district is contacted immediately, um, so I can be involved with those discussions. Uh, it would just basically save us all a lot of headache um, and stress to have all that information available to the public prior to that meeting taking place. So. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was one of, I, I received a lot of phone calls too. Right, and yeah, I'm sure. I had hoped that we would have put out a countywide email or notice that these were the results and that so this could have a lot of this well I, I do plan on doing that um, I wanted to come here today um, I actually just got our most recent test results in midweek last week so I kind of threw a bunch of stuff together to show up here today um, we will be putting something up on the website along with the Facebook page um, to share uh, all of the test results our CCR I've been actually waiting for these test results to come in so I can have an up-to-date CCR put out so that'll be on the website in the next couple weeks also okay yeah I appreciate you coming in and clearing it up. Is there any uh, comments from the board? Uh, I just wanted to say, I, oh. you know, I, I'm a <laughs> I apologize um, for all the the turmoil. And it, this could have easily been avoided. Right. It was it was a letter that was written that unfortunately was was targeted in such a way as to generate uh, uh, an uncomfortable fear in people right. about about a water source mm -hmm. and yet there was no data to back it up right and you know it, that was one of my objections initially to it um, uh, because I, I, I saw that it was pushed in that direction for a purpose to right. to get a grant um, and it caused a lot of concern in, in, in the community oh, yeah, that was exactly. unnecessary and unneeded because such a such a issue did not exist in the water system and I appreciate you coming and clarifying that to a lot of people. Of course. And also, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate that you had to jump through so many hoops uh, that were unnecessary to to deal with that uh, organization's letter. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Uh, Supervisor Howard, like to reserve his comments after public comment. What about you, Supervisor Board? Just do you have anything? Just a question. Where sure. is your water? Um, taken from so we have four wells that sit alongside Rowdy Creek on the north end um, pretty close to the 101 bridge uh, we're actually just a little bit downstream from uh, the fish hat fish hatchery so we've got four wells that run alongside Rowdy Creek um, they're all drilled into the ground so we don't pull directly from Rowdy Creek at any point um, they're all 40 foot deep wells which is about 20 feet below the, the water surface level and, um, and so that's where your testing is from, is from those wells? Correct, yes. Is there any testing done on surface water? Uh, that's, that's not by the department, creek? that's done by the state. Gotcha. Is there yeah. anybody that pulls water out of I, I, surface I as can, far as drinking water? Um, as there may be residents, I'm not sure, um, that have their own systems, but as far as, you know, the Smith River s water system goes, there's nothing pulled from surface water. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, with that, I'd like to open it up for public comment. Um, any member of the public that wishes to uh, address number 18, you may come forward. Hi, I Mr. Strait. a question for this gentleman. In the March 28th meeting, we were addressed by a representative of the Smith River Coalition, and he seemed to imply that the Forest Service had some sort of data regarding uh, metal contamination in Rowdy Creek. And I was wondering if this gentleman has had any contact with the Forest Service to find out if that data actually exists or whether the Smith River Coalition was fabricating that information. Um, I can say that I, I reached out to the Forest Service and they did not appear to have that information. But if you, Mr. Beard, if you don't mind answering that. Sure. Yeah, actually, I just received those reports yesterday. Um, so Smith River Alliance got those to me yesterday. Um, they had reached out to me yesterday morning. Um, there were positive test results for arsenic in the water from surface water, both in the northern and uh, lower section, upper and lower section of Rowdy Creek, um, well below the EPA standards on all of those. Um, but there was very limited data on it also. It was only about two years of testing. So, um, and our testing spans 30 years. Okay, I'm gonna follow up with a question. Co and copper, copper was the same thing, so it was, it was extremely low. 
but they didn't do a lot of testing for it in the actual um, Rowdy Creek. They did more in, it looked like Smith River. I was in, had an idea about that, but, but that's the big question. Should we, do we want to go and kick a sleeping dog or not? Or if it would even have no effect, I don't know. So I don't know if Jeff has information about I that. I believe he said he wasn't going to speak for or against that. Yep. <laughs> he took that, that fine line. Mr. Bieber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, very good. And thank you for coming in and trying to sort this out. Very disappointing that elected officials use their power to threaten and coerce the public to try to attract funds. You should have more accountability for your actions and what you portray in your policy. Um, I was wondering about a, the dates so that you, there's two different dates that have a positive number. I think it was like October, there was a week difference, but there's two different dates on the, sorry, I probably left it. My other pad paperwork there, but one is the, uh, the test, the, the laboratory spike control that was initiated, and then there's two other dates, the 4th and I think the 21st. So, wondering about that. And then the report says that uh, arsenic and hardness samples were added per client request. I was just wondering if the county knew there was something going on and requested the testing of that or how, what that reference is in the report. And I think maximum contamination levels is 10 parts per million, is that right? For, for arsenic? Arsenic is 10 parts per billion. Per, per billion. So we're about a quarter of the way, and that's right. measured every year, and there just seems to be a inconsistency with some of the reporting. Um, you know, the dates aren't very consistent in their scheduling, so I can get those dates. One was the 11th, the other was on the 4th. So are those the same? Yeah, let's see. Okay, so well, we're not gonna do it back and forth, but so, so Mr. Beaver, if you wanna finish your question, and Mr. Okay. Beaver can answer it, thank you. It just has a couple of different dates. All right, all right. Reach out to us if you have any other questions about that. Can you address that? Thank you. So I'm not sure exactly which one he's talking about. Um, as far as the test that was just taken in recently, um, so they do a laboratory spike, um, basically just to make sure their equipment's working properly. So that one's gonna show a huge number on there, obviously. Um, they also do a method blank, which would basically just be like, you know, neutral water that has nothing in it, you know. Um, and then our test results are the ones that came in um, non-detect also. So uh, as far as another result, our test result that's showing any sort of uh, residual or anything like contaminants in it, it would have most likely been from the laboratory spike. Um, as far as the testing that goes over the span of the entire history of the department over there, or the district, um, we've tested in 1990, 92, 93, 95, 2001, 2010, uh, 2019, and then just last month. Uh, the reason why there isn't a schedule for this testing is because it's never tested, it's never shown a need to do that. Um, and then to answer your other question, um, we don't, we don't, we're not governed by the county. The only people I respond to as far as water quality issues go is gonna be the state. Um, so if they tell me to do something, then I do it. It's kind of a, you know, if you say jump, I'll jump, you know, basically. Uh, you don't want the Water Resources Control Board on your bad side, so. Absolutely. Um, every, every, everything's tested according to what they ask us to test for. So. Okay. Um, arsenic testing, though, has been done on our own, though. Uh, that was never required by the state. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other public comments before I close public comment? 
All right, we will close public comments. Supervisor Howard, you have thoughts? No, I, I appreciate this. this has been a robust conversation, a lot of clarity added. Really appreciate the community service district coming in today and adding that clarity and some of the details uh, specific to Supervisor Borges' questions, groundwater versus surface water. And there was a fuzzy line that was drawn with trying to insist that this was groundwater that could have potentially been a source of contamination, which it wasn't. So I appreciate you clarifying that for the general public, but it does go back to what Mr. Powell just brought up to us, which is the original root of this conversation. In essence, what is going on in the headwaters of the Smith River, in particular Rowdy Creek and Copper Creek? And we do know the data does exist, the reports do exist. You are personally in receipt of those. There are three priority mines that the Forest Service has identified in 2009 that are leaching much of what we've discussed today, including the arsenic in the water table. What they're looking for, arsenic, chromium, copper, lead, nickel, zinc, those things are being tested for, and that's why those three mines in particular of the many in our Smith River NRA were called out by the Forest Service as being the top priority and why the Natural Resources Goal Committee thought it would be best if we forwarded a letter of support for the Smith River Collaborative to pursue the funds. And after the meeting, obviously, clarity was needed. And so you're here today, appreciate that. I also sought clarity from recent groundwater testing and received that from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, where they do surface water testing. You got plenty of groundwater testing going on with those drinkable waters that go to all those homes in Smith River. The data's good. The surface waters, however, the surface waters, however, there are large detectable levels of definite metals. In particular, there are several, in this case, chromium and zinc that go way above the EPA standards. And arsenic is not one of those that goes above the EPA standards. I've got data going at least back to what they sent, 2013, and for the Smith River going back to 2008. But consistently throughout those tests, whether it's Morrison Creek, Lower Rowdy, Upper Rowdy, Delilah, Tillis, um, those chromium and zinc concentration, or uh, chromium and nickel concentrations are quite high and way above the standard EPA levels. And it makes sense. I had a, a lengthy discussion with a geologist who, um, Forest Service geologist, uh, Mike Furness, PhD. He's, he's written a lot on this, and we're dealing with some of the heaviest metal concentrations on Earth in the High Plateau area, which is essentially the North Fork of the Smith and those areas that drain into Copper and Rowdy. It's, it's a rich area of resources, and it was why there's so many mines up there. Whether or not this board supports at a point in time going back and giving a lot of support to go deal with these highest priority mines in the, in the system, that's something that uh, I think the Forest Service is going to pursue on their own without our letter of support at this point. But it was a worthwhile conversation and it obviously gave us an opportunity to really tell folks about our groundwater and how uh, clean it is within the Smith River Community Service District School. I do thank you for your time. Uh, yes, One real quick thing. Um, as, as far as how clean our water is, it's actually unbelievably clean. It's, it's almost too clean. Um, it has, it's Not very soft minutes. water. Uh, very low mineral content um, that it actually tries to leach minerals out of other people's pipelines in their house and stuff and that's where the high copper residuals come from for that reason. Um, I did increase our pH levels. I know this is going to be above a lot of people's head in here but um, one of the things I did when I first got there in the district was incre increase our pH levels which brings your water more alkaline versus acidic um, which stops with the etching of the pipes. So. That's the first thing. And we'll be testing again for copper um, in July, so. Yeah, and, and Supervisor Howard, I'm, I'm not opposed to revisiting the conversation about supporting that. I just felt like the way it was presented um, was based out of fear, and that's not something, okay. So I, if you, that's something that wants to come back forward in the future, I think that that's something that we can revisit, so. Anything else on this subject? Mr. Beard, thank you so much for coming in today. I very much appreciate it. The, the only thing I want to say is, is that, yeah, it, and I made the comment to to the uh, member mm -hmm. that, uh, that brought the letter forward that I'd be supportive of, of having those closed down, uh, especially those that are, are you know, showing leaching, um, if that was a specific 
request, and that would be, you know, something I would be very supportive of. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bieber. Thank you. I'm going to go back now. Thank you. you um, appreciate that. I'm going to go back to the consent agenda and take the two items that I pulled so that uh, staff can move along. We have no more timed items. So with that, with item number five, why I pulled that is because I understand that times are rough and everything is backlogged, but it felt like 500 calendar days from the commencement date to f have that generator here and installed seemed excessive to me, but I, I was just hoping for a little more clarification if 18 months is, is in today's standards, is that's pretty normal. We agree, we were shocked. Uh, COVID-19 slowed production tremendously, as it did with a lot of other things. Um, and between the production and the delivery, we were 500 plus days out. Wow. So Okay, and then the only other question I had is it says the Flynn Center is utilized as a backup emergency operator and center. Where's mm -hmm. our primary center? We don't have a, I mean, it would be used as the, yeah, Crescent Fire. Okay, so, all right. I, I didn't think that they were still there. Okay, those are the only two questions. So with that, um, if I could, I'll take a motion to approve. No, oh, I'll have public comment on number five first, I'm sorry. Is there any public comment on number five? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion for number five. Move to approve item number five. Thank you. Second. All right, thank you very much. Super, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please pull the vote? Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. And then with number eight, I do apologize that I pulled that. Um, what I am kind of curious to know is that it's saying here, is it kind of a first come first serve who gets the surplus vehicles? Because in the report it indicates that search and rescue has um, indicated that there was a need for a truck and under Sheriff Devin Perry had reached out for that. How did we decide to give it to building maintenance? I believe I became aware that building maintenance wanted it first, but I think procedurally the process is that departments that are in need of vehicles that we are supposed to contact administration, the administrative office, and probably building maintenance <laughs> um, to tell them of our need. And then when a vehicle becomes available, they would let us know, and then there would be some decision made. I'm kind of caught in the middle of this. No, one, I'm, so not, to no speak. I'm not saying it's a bad decision. Yeah, I'm yeah no, and I, and, um, no, and I, it's, uh, it's a really good point to raise. Well, I'm glad so you brought it up. Yeah. Because I, I just want, I mean, I wanted you to know, though, that, yeah, that there was another person in, or party interested. Okay, so um, CAO Lopez, can you explain what the process, how do we pick one or the other over the other? <laughs> there isn't really a written process, so it would be, really be the first person that requested it, the need for it, and actually provided justification, which both entities did, and, and Building Maintenance was the first department to reach out and ask for the vehicle. Okay, all right. So uh, search and rescue, if they can just be kept on the radar in the future, if there is a surplus vehicle, a truck. So um, I will take public comment on number eight, Seeing no public comment, I will close public comment and bring it to the board for a motion. I move to approve. Second. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, could you close the vote? Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. Thank you. All right. We are going to now move on to general government. We pulled number 19, and so we are going to have number 20. And this is to receive an update on a grant filed with the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Community Resilient Center program as requested by the Assistant County Administration Officer, Mr. Randy Hooper. Mr. Hooper. Howdy, board. So yeah, this is uh, really just an update for the benefit of the board and, and by extension, uh, the public. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, monies that come into the county for various programs and services uh, don't really receive uh, much attention, um, but whenever it's a, a, a project that would potentially have benefit to the community, uh, we do uh, try to put, you know, a bit of a spotlight on it just to kind of raise awareness that, you know, while we have very constrained resources for implementing projects, especially capital improvement projects, unfortunately, as you heard um, earlier today from the county engineer, 
um, whenever opportunities to come forward or present themselves to address um, you know, these issues, we do try to be proactive. So um, just for a little bit of background on this one, uh, we were notified through our coalition of uh, rural uh, counties in California, RCRC, of a funding opportunity through CDFA that had to do with community resiliency uh, centers, which is kind of a fancy uh, way of saying is that the state is making money available to local uh, communities, fairgrounds, counties, cities, special districts, to look at your infrastructure in the context of some of the issues that we've been facing as a state, uh, climate change and, and wildfires and flooding and all of these things, and how can we be more resilient as a community uh, to our citizens? And so because the opportunity, um, again, was brought to our attention through RCRC is being undersubscribed, meaning that the uh, program didn't have as many applicants as there was funding available for, it presented a really unique opportunity to get pretty serious and proactive on something that we know uh, we need here because we do have you know, these issues that occur in Delmar County. Um, other communities you know, may want to establish heating and cooling centers or you know, smoke um, retreat areas from wildfire uh, smoke. Um, you know, even as we experienced over the winter uh, with cold uh, temperatures, having to mobilize, you know, kind of on the fly, an emergency uh, shelter at the fairgrounds, you know, really looking a little more critically at some of the infrastructure that we have here within our own um, ownership at the, at the county. And we do, we have uh, the Veterans Memorial Hall, and we have the Recreation Gymnasium right next door. Um, that are really, you know, if they were to be used for these purposes, could be enhanced in, in pretty meaningful ways to benefit the community. Um, you know, we do hear pretty frequently just the functionality and the aesthetics of various county buildings could, could be improved. Um, and it is always a matter of uh, resources. So, and of course, you all know that as the board and setting the budget, um, again, looking to augment our local resources with opportunities that may come along, this just seemed like, you know, too good of an opportunity to let pass up. So, um, the way it was presented from RCRC, um, because it really was such a good opportunity, we really wanted to encourage RCRC counties to, to check it out. Uh, they actually said they would make uh, a staff member available to put the project together for us. So, um, kind of a no-brainer uh, for us at the staff uh, level at that point to say, yeah, we'd love to have you guys, you know, help us put something together based on, you know, these facilities that we have. We know we have needs. Uh, we put the request in, uh, didn't hear anything. We put the request in again. We still didn't, still didn't hear anything. And so I think it was the day before the applications were due. We said, hey, we want to do this. Um, what, what resources can you make available? And of course, at that point, the resources weren't available. We had to do it ourselves. So um, didn't have an opportunity to get in front of the board. Apologize for that. Um, but again, too good of an opportunity from our opinion to uh, let go. So we went ahead, uh, we had already done some of the legwork on, on putting the project together. Um, really, you know, big kudos to our building maintenance department and to our OES department to kind of mobilize, go out there, do a quick assessment on, you know, what all can we do here to get these things in a position that, you know, we would like them for, the, for them to be in. Um, so I took that data, um, worked with a technical advisor that was provided through CDFA, really at the last minute to kind of, you know, put all the pieces of it together. Um, and we came up with a project. Um, we're hopeful that it gets funded. Um, obviously, if we do get funded, we'll come back with, um, with a really, really big uh, smile on our, on our collective faces uh, because we are asking for about $8 million uh, for these two facilities, and it would be huge in terms of what we could do if it's funded. Uh, there is no local match, and so this would be straight into the improvements that we need to do. Um, basically, as I kind of alluded to, it's going to be various you know, aesthetic and, and functional improvements to the buildings. Um, you know, heating and cooling upgrades, air filtration, uh, shelter area for the public, uh, lockers, uh, solar panels, ADA improvements that are long, long overdue, um, and so things of that nature. And again, we'll have, you know, much more uh, details available if we do get funded. Uh, we did include a, a copy of the grant application in your package, so you can kind of see the approach that we took in, in putting it together. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge and express my appreciation to the partners within the community that supported the project. Um, oftentimes, one of the things that makes or breaks these applications is the support that you get. And so we put out kind of a last minute call for letters of support for the project. We received quite a few, uh, you know, all the, the people that you'd expect to be supporting the project, the Family Resource Center, CASA, um, you know, various other uh, local districts and, and agencies. Um, federal and state uh, representatives, we did receive a letter of support from Congressman Huffman, Assemblymember Wood, 
Senator McGuire, who came in uh, after the, the application was due, but they did express their, their support for the project. So very, very broadly supported and appreciative for all that. And as I said, I'm um, hoping to find out, I think within the next probably two months, um, whether it's it's funded. I hope it continues to be undersubscribed because obviously if it's a competitive program, that puts us in a much uh, better position. Uh, but we'll, we will keep you up to date. Um, available if there's any questions, but that's kind of that project and a little bit of a, a nutshell. Thank you. I will have some questions. Does any sure. of the board member have any questions today? My question is, um, what kind of community outreach are we going to do when, when, if we get funded? We're going to get funded. I'm going to just be positive. Um, because what, what I don't want to see happen, these are all really great um, opportunities and, and perfect solutions for, for the things that we need. I don't want to see the veterans displaced out of their building. So is I understand it doesn't seem as if that's going to happen, but I would want them to be part of that process and that communication. So are we going to do some community outreach when we get funded? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the idea with getting a letter of support, getting the community buy-in was kind of a, you know, an illusion to the idea that as we get into this process, it's going to be very collaborative. Um, all the stakeholders and, and partners um, and, and players would certainly be involved, and in, in obviously the public. Um, I would envision, you know, some public workshop to kind of put together a vision for what, you know, we want to have in these facilities and, and using the, the funds that are provi hopefully provided or will be provided as you're, you know, well, kind of yeah. making it happen um, is fully incorporated. All right, and I read over the grant application last night, and you guys did a tremendous amount of work in a short amount of time, and it was very um, um, influenced, influencing. So I, awesome. I think that, I, th I'm, I think we're in a good position. Um, so thank you, Mr. Hooper. Is there any public comment with regard to this item, number 20? Mr. Strait. I hear everybody doing the happy dance when you get grant funding. And there are a ton of grants that have come into this community where, you, you know, major infra infrastructure projects have occurred and uh, there's no thought whatsoever to what happens after the projects are completed and down the road 10 years, you've got huge maintenance costs attached to these projects that the community can't possibly afford that somehow uh, we continue this process of getting, I believe the city is now trying to get a $3 million grant for more funding for Beachfront Park. And I'm wondering how we're gonna take care of, you know, any of the things that we've already managed to acquire from grant funding. I mean, we just talked about a sewer project here in this meeting where years of deferred maintenance that weren't uh, associated with the original funding and now here we are 10 years down the line the cost for maintenance is you know astronomically higher than it would have been had maintenance been considered in the first place is there any consideration in this particular project for maintenance down the road and I think there is not and it, it, you know sometimes it's not a bad thing not to uh, pursue grant funding when it uh, is going to burden the community down the road for su substantial amounts of money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strait. I, I've made note of your deferred maintenance question. Uh, okay, with that, we are, anything else from the board? I'm sorry, I want to give you one more opportunity. Okay. Um, we're gonna move on now by number 21, by or or board order, fixed the date, hour, and place of hearing on the petition, i.e. street vacation application, for a segment of Westbrook Lane from Highway 101 to its northern termini as requested by the assistant engineer. Ms. Bowers. So today all we are doing is setting the date for the public hearing. Um, we're not discussing the street vacation. Um, are there any questions on that? Um, when would you like the hearing? Uh, it's on the attached public hearing notice. <coughs> I see that you have it. It's the second board meeting in May. All right, is there any objections to the second board meeting in May? At 10.40 a.m. At 10.40 a.m.? May 23rd. May 23rd. Do you need a motion and approval for that? I need a board order, so I think so. Okay, so. Um, so moved. 
All right, thank you, Supervisor Howard Second. and Supervisor Borges. Is there any public comment with regard to this? Seeing none, we will close public comment. Madam Clerk, will you please pull the vote? Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. Thank you. Moving on to number 21, introduce an ordinance amending the tobacco retail license to allow the transfer of licenses to subsequent owners. Is that 22? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and designate county council to prepare a summary for publication as requested by county council. This is a, a small update to the tobacco retail license ordinance. All it does is allows people who are businesses that have a license to transfer it to a new owner in the same location that they sell. There's still, you can't transfer locations and you still can't get a new one if you weren't in business as of July 1st, 2022. Move to approve. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Is there any public comment with regard to item number 22? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Strait. What happens when a business were to go out of business that had a license, did that license go away? It would. So at some point, for instance, we do have a fair amount of business turnover in this community and that, uh, are we going to end up with no licenses at some point or very few or? There's eight licenses in the county. And so our thought was that we're not going to expand that beyond that. I don't know the answer to your question. If, if Mr. Clamble Blair wouldn't mind just quickly answering that. How many licenses did you say? Eight. I believe there's eight to 10, but I think there's only eight in the county. I thought there was eight. Well, thank you. Yeah. In the county, in the city jurisdiction, there's more. There's so there's 22 total, but the county only has the eight. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Could you please pull the vote? Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Wilson? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes. Um, now, am I able to do all budget transfers at one if I read them? Yes. Okay. So um, we're moving on to items number 23, 24, 25, and 26. They're approve and adopt budget transfer 0402 in the amount of $387,500 within the Measure R budget unit for the capital improvement projects located at the Del Norte County Sheriff's Department and Veterans Memorial Hall as previously authorized by the Board of Supervisor. Number 24, authorize a one-time contribution to help fund the establishment of a National Center for Public Lands Counties and approve the corresponding budget transfer 0404 in the amount of $35,777.17 within the contingency advertising promotion budget units as requested by Chair Short. Approve and adopt budget transfer 0405 in the amount of 90351 within the Sheriff's Department jail budget to allow for expenditure of funds for the purchase of updated taser body camera equipment as requested by the Sheriff. And number 26, approve and adopt the budget transfer 0406 in the amount of $137,770 within the Sheriff's Department budget to allow for expenditure of funds from the professional services and the purchase of updated taser body camera equipment as requested by the Sheriff. So with that, I actually want to remove uh, number 24 for a separate vote or for the discussion. Absolutely. That is removed. I move to approve items 23, 25, and 26 as read into the record. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. I Do will I second those. Thank you, Supervisor Borges. Any public comment with regard to 23, 25, or 26? Mr. Strait. Just so we're clear, uh, measure our funding for the parking lots at the Sheriff Station and Memorial Hall are now considered uh, fire, uh, police, and uh, emergency services imperatives in this county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and just for clarification, was this um, approved by the Measure R Committee as well? Has it been? It was mentioned to the Measure R C Committee and they were in support of it. These are vital services. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that, any other public comment? I will close public comment and bring it back to the board for a vote. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Wilson? 
Yes. Supervisor Borges? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Starkey? Yes, thank you. Supervisor Borges. So, uh, my concerns with um, this item is we are taking general fund dollars and donating them to a national uh, advocacy group, I guess, or a national program. And I don't quite understand what we're getting for that. And then I also have a concern on the board report. It was not signed off fully, so I don't quite understand what happened there. Those are my concerns. CAO Lopez, can you um, explain the, the non-sign, the non-signature on the board report? The auditor and the um, auditor's office are not, there's no approval from them. Just it just says pending. He chose not to sign it. I don't know if he's on line or if he wants to speak to that. Assessor, uh, Auditor Shad, are you online? I don't see him online. Okay. Um, what we could do, since this is Supervisor Short's matter, we could bring this back at another time. And, and I'm certainly of the ability right now to speak about it okay. and at least help educate folks, because I know there's a sensitive timeline that is being pushed by NACO and CSAC and RCRC on this particular um, funding obligation, to which would essentially create the National Center for Public Lands counties, which really benefit only the counties in, in this part of the United States here, the forested counties in particular. Um, but if, if you want to table this until uh, Chair Short's back, I know there was a May 17th deadline by the NACO WIR meeting to try to get some approvals in for this, but I could go into some detail if you'd like to now, or if you're on the fence, then I could, we could wait till Chair Short's back. Yeah, as it sits now, I'm pretty well on the fence. Um, Okay. So if you'd like to explain it, that's fine, or we could. Yeah, so, um, and um, I know Neil and, and Randy could also jump in when they want to, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it right now. So um, as you guys are aware, we're 80% public land, and we're not the only county in the state of California, or in particular in the western U.S., that is very heavily public land. And so um, we lobby in particular as a county, but also as CSAC, also as NACO, also as RCRC in Washington, D.C., to try to continuously push for dollars that are called either payment in lieu of taxes, PILT, or secure rural schools and roads. Matter of fact, it's, since I've been on the board, it's been on the chopping block multiple times by Congress to not to get renewed funding. And it always gets written back in in riders associated with other bills but it does make its way through. The problem is, is that this county in particular, like other rural counties that have heavy public land base, um, if that goes away, that impacts our general fund. And so what was decided on at NACO, who continuously lobbies essentially for this type of funding with Congress, is to ensure a long-term data set that will allow us to lobby more effectively about the impacts of having public lands in our backyard. And that's the bottom line. When we go to Washington, D.C., and we have conversations with our representatives, we're lobbying for that dollar to come back to us through these two payment types. Um, they affect our schools, they affect our county roads budget, and they obviously affect our general fund. Um, when they get on the chopping block, that becomes an issue. And if we don't have data to bring back there to lobby about the impacts of those public lands, whether they're national parks or whether they're forest service, which makes up the great deal of these lands, because we've been told that by not only the state of California, but by Congress, they want these lands in a national recreation area. And in national recreation, there's only so much we can do with those lands now. And the tourism dollar on those national recreation area lands are just not gonna generate what a forested dollar would have generated through timber revenues, which came to the county, which in this case, PILT would replace. And so showing those impacts through hard data versus anecdotal information about this is what we're seeing in the county has become a sounding board in NACO for a long period of time. And so what was proposed by NACO and WIR, which is the Western Interstate region of NACO, what was proposed at that time was essentially to take this one-time funding that we saw during COVID um, and 
it was augmented by a proposal out of Senator Wyden and pushed about 750 million to this one-time augmentation that we really saw here in Pilt counties throughout the U.S. This is really where those dollars landed. And so without NACO's push, Pilt counties would have never seen these dollars. So what they proposed coming out of WIR was basically to take a one-time payment to create this national policy center that would collect data with 1% of that augmented funds. In this case, it was about, um, I can't remember the exact figure for Delnark County, but it would essentially amount to the 35,000 that is on our, our budget contingency uh, request today. Um, so from my experience, and as Graham Canoss, who is the current director of the California State Association of Counties, he sees this as a generational opportunity, a one-time shot to really get the data us Western County or Western counties in the United States really need to lobby Congress for more permanent funding than what we're seeing out of SRS and PILT. And so that's the long and short of it. And hopefully that addresses some of your questions, but I, I could go into more. There's um, some paperwork that was sent out by CSAC that I don't believe the board's received yet, um, but we could send that around uh, at some point, I suppose. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. Supervisor Borges? So if I understand, you know, this is national, so they'd be going, or NACO is going after federal money. Is that what we're after, What's which PILT? is not PILT, PILT state money? Is that separate? No, there's also, PILT's also state, but they don't pay their bills, as Randy and Neil know oftentimes, and we've been complaining to the state senate and state assembly for forever, they don't pay their bill in our backyard for those lands that they acquire. But federal government does, but it's always and has been since I've been on the board on the chopping block and was long before I got on this board. And so we're already receiving the funding that they're going after. Is that correct? We've already received. We've already received it. And so whenever it's issued, we receive it. And so this would be to go after more permanent receiving. Um, and then if we do not donate or contribute or whatever the term is, we still will receive, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's not, that's the problem. Uh, that's what they're trying to cure. And do we not have lobbyists and people already fighting for this? Without data. Pushing for it? And then what is the total amount that they're trying to they're, accomplish? They're trying to fundraise a 15 million. And so right now, um, many counties throughout the state of california and uh, throughout the western region are having these very discussions like we are today if they don't hit their funding goal then no harm no foul the money stays in our budget if they come close to hitting that 15 million funding goal then the national policy center in this case would be set up and the data would begin to be collected okay i guess i'm still not quite sold on it well it's fair yeah okay supervisor wilson do you have anything you want to add right now yeah, it's, like I say, it's, it's one of those issues where we, we're receiving the funding and, and, and it's always threatened. I understand that because went went through it and lost uh, several fundings to sheriffs over the years. So I definitely understand the need for, for lobbying it. I understand the need for, for having that advocacy there. Um, apparently NACO is already doing that. This is just a data collection component that they're wanting to generate. But that's what I get. So I'm, I'm perfectly content, obviously, with waiting to, for Chair Short's uh, piece to come back up on our agenda. Um, I know we've both had uh, long discussions at the CSAC board meeting here last week on this issue. Um, obviously, CSAC wouldn't be get behind something that they didn't think would make a, a difference, and that's exactly why Graham's saying it's generational in this case. And for, for me personally, having been here for eight years, having had these conversations in D.C., I would love to have a data set like this to show the impact of taking away those resources that did pay our bill and make this economy turn. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable at this point now, Chair, to, to wait till Chair Short's back. I, I do agree because I, I also want to reach out to the superintendent of schools. He's been back to D.C. recently um, advocating for the SRS monies as well. So I think that it's a larger picture that we might want to, sure. to look at. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up for public comment, but then I would t entertain a motion to table it. 
Is there any public comment with regard to number 24? Thank you, Mr. Bieber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to take any opportunity to show how we're using government to impose more government. Um, you mentioned, you know, CSAC and RCRC and NACO, all these groups and committees that we're a part of. And, you know, we have lots of committees in the county. Some we go to, some we don't go to, but are they really serving our best interests? And I, uh, I viewed the CSAC meeting and I was pretty disappointed. And I didn't think that those state priorities were our county's priorities. And if we need affiliation like that to get money, we don't need the money that bad. You know, I mean, start governing for yourselves and just, I hate to say it, say it but it's like you're prostituting the county. You know, not all money is good money. So we have to be accountable and I don't know, we just need to, you guys need to empower yourselves and do it yourselves. We don't need the state telling us everything we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Beaver. Okay, with that, I'd entertain a motion to table this. Uh, motion to table. Vice Chair Sarkey, yes. I just wanted to clarify real quick about my comment. I just didn't want to speak for Clint um, and I thought he was on, uh, had joined us on this meeting, but uh, apparently he didn't. So oh, it's it, okay. if we do bring it back, then he'll be available for that. That would be great. Right, and we'd you. like we'd like that information. Like I said, I'll reach out to the superintendent of schools and see if he can't come and join the in the discussion as well. And I'd make the motion to the table. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. We've closed public comment. If we could have now pull the, pull the vote. Supervisor Borges. Yes. Supervisor Wilson. Yes. Supervisor Howard. Yes. Vice Chair Sturkey. Yes. All right. With that, we are now moving on to our legislative and budget issues. And we are, uh, so far I'm right on track, right, Madam Clerk? <laughs> yes. Okay. And on time. Uh, I'm not on time, but um, we're going to go with uh, number 27, which is our fiscal year 23-24 agriculture budget presentation. Mr. Uh, Justin, I, your last name is escaping to me, but I know it. Riggs. Riggs, Mr. Riggs, please join us. All right, thank you. <coughs> and how does this advance? You can use the roller in the middle or um, should be able to click as well. Okay, great, thank you. <coughs> so again, I'm Justin Riggs. I'm the Agricultural Commissioner and Sewer of Weights and Measures for Del Norte County. I've worked for the county since 2015. <coughs> It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about uh, our budget, but also some of our accomplishments and challenges, uh, and also the many things that um, have moved forward during this last fiscal year uh, through the team efforts of our department, admin, the board, and, and many other departments who supported us. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what we do here. So um, next to the programs, you're going to see some percentages there. Uh, that is how much of our time in terms of agricultural programs we spent. It's not the overall departmental time, but um, the there are certain programs that are designated as being subject to unclaimed gas tax funds and are our core programs that we perform. And on this slide and the next slide, um, I have those programs listed. So some, some things to note as far as um, our activity percentage is last, normally speaking, the pest eradication and pest management, which involves weed management, would be considerably higher than that. Uh, last year, the staff who normally do that work were diverted to animal care and could not and could not perform much of that work. So, I expect to see that rise, and I expect to see more of those services coming our way. And I'll talk about some exciting new funding in that area a little bit later. Um, I want to point out uh, pest exclusion. That's uh, that's a big and growing program for our county. COVID-19 has. Um, seen some changes, some good changes in, in how um, homeowners and landowners are using their land. More people are, are planting. That means a lot more nursery stock has to come into the county for all those people to buy 
and put in their yards. Uh, we're finding a lot of pest problems on it. We're taking actions, um, you know, doing a lot of education um, of the nurseries and the growers, communicating with source counties to cut back on these issues. I do not want these pests coming in and causing Del Norte agriculture uh, any problems or our homeowners or our uh, ecology. Pesticide use enforcement is always our biggest program. Um, you know, we, we fill an important role of monitoring the use of pesticides in the county. Obviously quite a bit of that work happens up in Smith River, but we do, we do surveillance of, you know, the companies that come and treat at people's homes. We inspect them and make sure that's being done safely so there's not contamination to neighbors or, or groundwater, any issues like that. Um, and of course, that, it, that program is by far our program that's most likely to incur liability to the county or become litigious or um, have negative reputation issues for the county. So that is always very important. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So here, a few of our other programs. Um, on this page, uh, we're seeing many of the programs that we just don't have the staff to devote appropriate time to. Unfortunately, with one of our three key um, licensed positions vacant, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, some choices have to be made. We cannot do everything with our current staffing. Um, so that's why a number of those percentages there are low. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so our weights and measures program has, uh, has been growing by leaps and bounds. We're getting a lot more in the way of registered devices. Um, we're getting, uh, with inflation, uh, everyone's looking at their bills closer. We're getting consumer complaints. Uh, and, you know, those can be very complicated to, to investigate and enforce. Um, they, many of these are cases that the county hasn't done in decades. Uh, there's no records or staff experience on that. So when it comes up, I've got to research business and professions code, figure out what the right thing to do is, maybe ask the state or other counties for some help. Um, so it's, it's a complicated program, and admittedly, it is not the program I came from in my last county. I was ag only, like many medium and large counties do. Um, so we can see some very important programs here. We test the gas pumps, the supermarket scales, we, you know, if a device is being used to determine what a consumer is paying for something, we're out there making sure that it's accurate. Most devices are tested on an annual basis. Some are tested a little less frequently. Um, and we have certainly struggled to keep up with those, um, with those schedules, but I think we've done an excellent job of it over the years, um, all things considered, and I anticipate that that will continue to improve. Uh, we have some equipment issues and weights and measures um, that's being addressed. Uh, there's been a very um, positive and collaborative process with county administration and the auditor's office to look at those issues and, and see what we can do. Um, we got a new weights and measures truck this year after our old truck was constantly caught. It wouldn't start. We are missing appointments, letting people down, making the county look bad. We've got that issue resolved now. Um, we're in the process of putting the last touches on it, um, making the customizations needed for um, it to go out and do what we need it to do. We have two newer, reliable vehicles now that can tow our, our um, petroleum proving trailer that is necessary to test the Calor Life Flight pumps, so we know that we can get there and serve them when they need our help. Um, next slide, please. So <coughs> this next section, this is not meant to, to be bragging or anything. I have all that up there because I want people to understand the requirements for this position um, <coughs> and, and why I'm proposing some of the changes to the department that, that I am this year. Um, I'm not wearing this mask because I like it. I'm not in great health. If something were to happen to me, we are, there is no one to, that can step in. There's no other northern counties with vacant positions right now. They can't find, they're struggling to find people. We need to work on succession planning. Um, and it, it's, it's extremely challenging in this environment. Um, one down towards the bottom of that, the authorized certification official certificate is, 
is important. Um, many commissioners and deputies do not maintain that certificate. I came from that kind of work. That certificate is required to, to issue the certificates that uh, allow the lily bulbs to ship out of country. So right now I'm the only person in the county that has that. Um, we would have to go through Humboldt County through an expensive process to get that service. Um, you know, if we can fill our vacant position, get multiple people trained in that certificate, have some redundancy there, I know I'd sleep a lot better at night. Uh, I think the bulb growers probably would too. Um, so it's 12 total licenses to be an agricultural commissioner after a Bachelor of Science degree. Um, next slide, please. So this is a key vacant position we have, and it has, you know, pretty similarly rigorous requirements. Um, there's not going to be someone in the county who, who has that. Um, <coughs> so we're looking to get someone from outside of the county or grow someone internally, you know, and motivate them to move up um, and take on those extra challenges. The management level licenses require going through oral exam panels. It's stressful. It requires a huge amount of preparation. Um, I, I was working 20 hours a week for years to pass these licenses after I moved here uh, on my own time after work. <coughs> so that's kind of what we're up against in recruiting. Uh, next slide, please. So we are very fortunate to have an experienced senior biologist here who has six years with us and has obtained five of those licenses. Um, I really want to make sure we keep her and that we, you know, give her some additional opportunities to advance. Um, it takes to train an inspector to really be able to go out and work with any independents. They need to go through two full growing seasons, two years of all the different certificate issuance, inspections, all the programs that we do. That on their third year, they can kind of finally start to really fully contribute. Um, you know, so we can't afford to hire people and have it not work out. It's just going to create longer delays in restoring our programs. Um, and we certainly can't afford to lose anybody. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one of the things I've proposed is changing our agricultural aid series to agricultural technician. Um, it's much more consistent with the work that we do here. Agricultural aid is usually minimal, like uh, someone on a weed crew who, who doesn't work independently, who doesn't have much scientific training or knowledge or technical skill. That is not how the people in our series have been. Um, so that's, that's a change I've proposed. Um, and it would also allow us to scale up if, if it is the board's pleasure and, the, you know, we get together and decide we want more weed management work done up, especially in Smith River, Fort Dick, or down in, in Klamath. Um, <coughs> you know, that this would give us a framework to do that. Um, next slide, please. We're very fortunate to have an experienced administrative secretary. Uh, now that um, a, a bunch of her time is freed up, that she's not doing animal services, 90% um, of her time, that's been huge. We're really able to move a lot more things forward. We've got some exciting new things going in public outreach that she's helping with. Um, and we are getting our fiscal things done in a much more timely manner now that we're in a more settled environment and people have the bandwidth to do it. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So some of the problems that we've had with past recruitments, I know that was one of the things that the board has been interested in from these presentations. Um, <coughs> we haven't had an outside applicant for the commissioner position since 2008. Um, it's just, it's always been someone who was, who was there. There's not been anyone else to choose from. And of course we had to work for 26 months under Humboldt County through an MOU because we couldn't uh, find a commissioner. Why is that a problem? Well, the board has no influence over a commissioner from another county. If you don't like what the decisions they make, you could end the MOU that's, and look for another commissioner. That'd be about all you could do. Um, they don't have the local knowledge, which the county agricultural commissioner system is based on. Um, <coughs> and they're, going to, they're not going to be here very much they're not going to handle, they're not going to do employee evaluations typically, they're not going to do the budget, <laughs> they're not going to run the department. They're just going to serve as the county agricultural commissioner and oversee the program. 
So it's not an ideal situation, especially th when you don't have a deputy to do the budget and run the office and all of that. Um, <coughs> we have had not had any luck in finding a deputy commissioner uh, that works out. Um, I've been the only inspector with any experience that's applied here for, for over 30 years. So we, we've had, and we are also facing a steady decline in applicants for agricultural aid positions, which is part of why I want to do the ag tech transition. So re recruiting has been a serious problem for our department, um, and it would be very difficult to replace any of our positions right now, I think, um, with people, especially given all the knowledge and experience we have in the department. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the barriers to recruitment and, and retention. Uh, our work environment was completely inappropriate for an agricultural commissioner's office. That's been resolved. We have, uh, we have a great new office now. We're, we're very productive and happy in there. Um, <coughs> very few commissioners would want anything to do with animal services. Very few deputies would look at an opportunity that involves that. Um, and it's definitely a barrier on retention. It nearly cost us our entire staff over the last few years on the ag side. That's been resolved. So those were two of our very biggest issues that through a lot hard work on the part of a lot of people have been resolved. Um, we're competing for a limited pool of statewide licensed applicants. This is a very specialized profession to be an agriculture and standards professional. There, there's no one in the county hanging around with these licenses. Um, there's not very many spare people in the entire northern region with any of these licenses, and it's, so we're, we'd be looking at either growing somebody completely from the beginning or trying to compete on a statewide basis, which uh, our current compensation doesn't allow us to do. There are our inspectors in the Bay Area making more than our commissioner position will probably be still making in 2030. And that's just to be an inspector. That's four levels of responsibility below being a commissioner. Um, <coughs> health insurance isn't competitive with other counties, nor the, a lot of the other benefits at this point. Um, <coughs> having a small office, uh, when there's a vacancy, it just puts a lot of stress on everybody else. Um, Chelsea and I have been covering the work of three licensed positions together for six years. Um, our accruals are both sky high. Um, we're, you know, we're pretty burned out from that. Um, we've got to get this other person in here to give us some help. Um, but they're gonna, if, if they're experienced, they're gonna have to come from hundreds of miles away and we have to entice them up here somehow. Um, in general, it's a statewide trend. Less people are willing to move up to the management level. The licenses, like I spoke about, are difficult to get. Um, senior bio positions are paying more and more. Peop a lot of people are just content to, to stay at that level. A lot of counties have set their, um, their bio positions equal to the environmental health inspector positions, which, is a, which in Del Norte would be a massive increase. Um, and that's, you know, we're, that's why a lot of people are just staying at that level now, I think. Uh, that and just general people not wanting to take on that kind of responsibility. Um, and we've struggled to find local applicants with a science degree to apply for even our entry level position. Um, next slide, please. So how do we fix that? Well, like we've talked about, we have a vastly improved working environment. Um, in many cases, we have some room for flexible scheduling. Um, you know, there's uh, sometimes, you know, and then of course with that comes requirements for people to be in at odd hours. Sometimes ag doesn't always happen conveniently, you know, from eight to five on uh, Monday through Friday. It goes on at other times too, and sometimes we need to be there to either help out or conduct an inspection. Um, <coughs> Ongoing replacement of vehicles and obsolete equipment. Um, this has, staff have noticed that you know they're not they're not having to call people and say, oh, I can't get to this appointment. You know that's really that's really a drag when you just you feel like like a fool when you just when you finally show up there after three canceled appointments. The truck's finally running. You're there now. Um, so, you know people really appreciate 
having newer, safer equipment to work with. Um, <coughs> I proposed a supervising biologist position. I have drafted it. It's, um, it creates a tier between our senior biologist and our deputy agricultural commissioner. It gives people a way to bridge that gap and, and move up. Instead of moving directly from a staffer lead level to a management level, they can move to a supervisory level in between. And also, it, in that way, there's a kind of a steadier progression in, in the compensation and the licenses required than when you don't have that step. Uh, I've also proposed a modest increase in compensation for the biologist series. <coughs> And, um, and the deputy commissioner position, I propose a significant increase to that as well. There, we need to incentivize staff to actually want to move up and take on that responsibility or attract someone from the outside who will actually want to stay. Um, no, no increase is um, proposed to the commissioner position. <coughs> um, and then you know, we've had improved departmental cohesion because we can all sit down at a table and, and communicate. It's, you know, what's going, what's, what's going on with this inspection? What's wrong with this equipment? We can all sit down and talk. We could never do that in our other office. Um, we, we were, one of us was always having to cover the phones, help up at the front, impound dogs. You know, it's, it's, so it's, it's such a huge change to, to be able to focus on our, our mission. And, and especially, I mean, I was an employee of both divisions, but these other employees were not. They were ag people who were being asked to spend up to half of their time on animal services. It's not what they came here to do. Um, next slide, please. So challenges being addressed. Um, I've, I've addressed the, the issue of a vacancy being very damaging through my reorganization proposal, which will hopefully reduce those. Um, Lack of a way to measures workshop, um, that's being worked on with admin and building maintenance. We've, we've had steady discussions about that. There's a lot of initiatives on the table and the, um, our requirements are fairly specific. So, you know, it's gonna, it might take a while to find the right spot for us, but I'm confident that that will happen. <coughs> Identifying sub-meter testing equipment that will work for Del Norte. So these are the sub-meters, uh, mobile home, parks um, for gas, water, and propane. Um, <coughs> it's it's going to be difficult to figure out exactly what equipment we need until we know about the workshop situation because the, some of these things are installed. So we have to have some general idea of what capabilities we'll have um, before we can move forward on that. But there's, uh, there's not, with a lot of this way to measure equipment, there's no source to go to to figure out what's right for you. You, ju you have to call other counties, you have to talk to the state, you have to talk to, to, it, to the people that make the devices and somehow figure all this out. So it, that's, uh, it's been quite a challenge, but we're making good progress on that. Um, our, our time tracking system is very cumbersome and requires me to do a lot of our, a lot of that, a lot of our reporting and such. Um, I'm, it's very last century. So uh, there is a software system for that. It's very affordable and it will easily, just, just the savings of my time will easily, uh, it'll pay for itself in that. Um, <coughs> lack of commissioners, especially in the Northern state, uh, succession planning is, is addressed heavily in, in my reorganization proposal. I, I can't promise that these changes that I'm, that I'm proposing will, will bring us the people we need and keep people. There's, there's no way to do that 100%. I'm trying to improve our chances. Um, and I, th I think that's probably, that, that's all anyone can do is, is, is put us in, a pos in the best position that we can be in to be a successful department. Uh, next slide, please. So our fiscal year 23-24 budget. Um, <coughs> I have not, I'm not requesting any additional, any additional um, staff. We'd be converting the agricultural aid series to agricultural technician. The modest increase for the inspector, inspector biologist compensation, that's two pay 
two pay codes for each one. <coughs> um, still leaving it well below other scientific positions in the county. Um, creating the supervising biologist position so that we'll, then we'll have a supervisor in the office. Uh, commissioners are supposed to travel over, over, be traveling over a month out of the year. I largely don't, um, but partially because there's no one to supervise when I'm gone. It's pretty difficult to be gone for a week and just, okay, run the office amongst yourselves. Um, I can leave direction, but they should have someone there to go to. Uh, gas tax and mill tax, these are by far our two biggest um, revenue sources, um, will increase significantly over the next two years. Um, we missed out on a lot of this money because of the time that ag staff were spending on animal services. Um, every hour that anyone who was designated as ag put in animal services, you know, we, we would lose over 50% of, of that money. So it's, it's a real bummer when you can't uh, bring that revenue in. So we are getting a new $20,000 weed management grant. Um, this was one that um, I was reticent to take on in the past, but now that we have the split accomplished, I'm, I'm confident that we can fulfill this obligation and uh, do a lot of good work out there to address issues that I know the and concerns the community has, especially with things like tansy. But we have several very serious weeds that are trying to get a foothold here and we don't want to let that happen. Um, small decrease in supplies and services costs. Um, this is largely because ag was dis disproportionately supporting facilities costs over um, at the other facility. So <coughs> we won't be doing that anymore because we're not there. Um, <coughs> don't have enough information yet to make the um, equipment request for submeter testing. Um, we are requesting a 50 gallon petroleum prover. However, I may withdraw that request after some of the quotes that are starting to come in. I just don't think we can probably do that, but we'll see if anyone can get come down a little for us or if anything comes in that's more reasonable, but it's costing over twice what I thought it would, so. <coughs> and I believe that, uh, that that wraps it up and I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Riggs. Does the board have any questions? Just out of curiosity, how many weights and measure units would you do? Like how many scales and how many things would you certify annually, would you say? Yeah, so we have, um, we have over 1,000 registered devices in, in Del Norte County. That's actually a list I can provide you at some point if you're interested in it. Um, not all of them are annually. Uh, the, so the submeters are done every 10 years uh, at the parks. Um, the, but uh, gas pumps, supermarket scales, those are done annually. Interesting. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you, Supervisor Borges. Any other supervisor? I'm going to open this up for public comment. Do I have to open it up for public comment? You don't have to. There's no vote, so you don't have okay. to. Um, if they have any public wants to ask any questions, you've been very receptive to the public, so they can reach out to you. Sure. Um, one of the, the goals that we're doing with these presentations is at some point we want to kind of gather a strategic plan for short term and long term. Um, so you've provided us with a lot of information for us to, to be able to uh, conclude your short-term goals as some long-term goals. So I appreciate the presentation. Well, thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, Mr. Strait, I'm going to go ahead and let you do public comment since I kind of teased it. I have a question. Um, Mr. Riggs indicated that it was a huge burden that had been relieved from his shoulders when animal control was transferred to the Sheriff's Department. And I was wondering, um, whether the board had ever considered or you know, thought beyond the transfer as to what kind of a burden this has now been placed on our sheriff's department. Yes, Mr. Strait, we'll hear from the sheriff soon. And so he'll, I'm sure he's going to answer that for you and Perfect. us. <laughs> Thank you. I think he's on one of the next agendas. All right, since I opened it up, go ahead, Mr. Beaver. Uh,
livestock used to be animal services. It, so it, prior to us making it animal service, it was called livestock. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is budget unit 259 was livestock. Um, I submitted a proposal to the board to change that name and the name of the division to animal services uh, a, a year or two ago. Right. So two budgets, yes, and, and so now um, budget 259 animal services falls under DNSO. All right, thank you, Mr. Riggs. And oh my goodness, okay, Mr. Powell. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. No, this is good stuff. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Dave Powell, thank you for the time. Um, a small part of what you talked about, but a big part that we deal with is the tansy weed. And uh, this doesn't impact me as much as it used to because we're kind of out of the tansy weed property growing business and glad to be. So I'm sure Joey is glad to be out of the tansy weed growing business as well. Um, but it w we used to spend a lot of time and money. Uh, maintaining our properties and keeping the tansy down and it was uh, very difficult to drive down the road and see the county property not being marshaled and taken care of with the tansy weed. Uh, so I, I encourage you know whatever kind of help we can give Mr. Riggs on that. It's a very uh, obvious and, and visible uh, thing that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Powell. And Mr. Riggs can you address that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <coughs> No, uh, from, from day one here, uh, I started in, in, uh, in Del Norte in June of 2015. So right at the beginning of tansy season, it was something I hadn't heard of, but from day one, it, we didn't have it in my previous county. So, uh, but from day one, I could tell that it mattered to people a lot here. And as I did some research, you know, to get familiar with the biology of the local pests here, I quickly saw why. You, you know, anything that's going to be poisonous to livestock, anything that's going to degrade rangeland is a concern. So <clears throat> we, we pull the county roadsides, um, we, and we will pull any county properties that we're made aware of. Uh, work, you know, in that case, we work with Alan on that um, and abate those. Um, also, we are, it, if we can, fit, especially if we can fill our vacancy, my hope will be to, you know, first start with some education, of course, but eventually, if that doesn't work, issue some administrative citations when needed on some of these properties that are continuing to have problems. I mean, we 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 do as much of that work we do as much of that work every year as we can. Unfortunately, it falls at the same time that the bulb growers are fumigating, and that requires my attention it requires chelsea's attention and we're really the ones that would also carry out the tansy enforcement side of things but i ma but i make sure that our ag aids when they didn't need to be used to clean kennels are out there pulling tansy frequently um, and our new weed and it also that activity is invoiceable on our new weed management grant grant so that's going to be a big boost to uh, tansy abatement great Thank you, Mr. Riggs. And, and if Mr. Powell, if you do happen to see um, some p tansy on county roads or county property, if you could just alert one of us where that location is so we can make sure we take care of that. And you're certainly welcome to cite California Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and state parks. Uh, I mean, I would give you that blessing for yes. certain. <laughs> well, that's what I was getting at. I think it could be on their land, but certainly want to uh, look into that. So thank you for those comments. Thank you, Mr. Riggs. I appreciate you coming. All right, we now have um, item number 28. I'm going to go through. I don't think we need a break, but if you do happen to want to get up uh, and use the restroom, you're going to miss some riveting conversation. Item number 28 is the fiscal year 23-24 uh, district attorney budget presentation. Ms. Mix, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's been great to see our county government at work, and you guys definitely pushed through lunch. I'm impressed. And just so you know, the DA's budget is very simple, pretty straightforward. I condensed what I was going to present today uh, just because I know how long this meeting was going to be. And I could go on and on about my department, but I will try to keep it uh, relatively brief. But of course, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. And if you don't feel like you have enough time, please reach out to us individually. OK, thank you. So uh, first up, just briefly, uh, this uh, slide um, 
basically is our mission statement. The employees of the DA's office in partnership with the community that we serve are dedicated to the pursuit of truth, justice, and protection of the innocent and the prevention of crime through the vigorous and professional prosecution of those who violate the law. So uh, the primary function of my office is to diligently pursue those who are believed to have violated the criminal codes of the state. We have a very high burden of proof when it comes to filing criminal cases. I spend quite a bit of time talking with um, people in the community about just what uh, burden of proof we have and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I think a lot of people get frustrated with that. Uh, there have been some comments and confusion in the past about my office maybe not pursuing things because of budgetary constraints. There has never been a case that's been rejected by my office because it's just too time consuming or too expensive. That is not something that I take into account and I must say that the board, uh, county administration and uh, our local government in general has been very supportive of my office. When I have come forward with things that I have requested and needed, uh, like a case management system, uh, some raises, uh, they have been very receptive and I greatly appreciate that. My office uh, functions at a high level um, and I am very proud of my office and appreciate all the support from everybody. Uh, briefly, the government code sections uh, list our responsibilities and basically uh, my staff and I prosecute all criminal cases on behalf of the citizens of the county. And so we review reports from CDCR, any offenses that occur out of the prison. We take reports from the sheriff, the PD, the park service, fish and wildlife, uh, you name it. We review the reports and uh, go forward from there. So this slide is basically the structure of the personnel of the district attorney's office. Um, I think this is just kind of a good illustration because as you'll see in the next slide, uh, basically the majority of the DA's budget is dedicated to salaries and benefits. Uh, that is uh, the vast majority of it. And um, so we have a bunch of lawyers we have to pay for, we have investigative staff, we have support staff, and we have victim witness. So um, at this point, as this um, slide shows, we currently have one vacancy. Uh, we lost a deputy DA within the last couple months. Prior to, I say, summer of last year, we were consistently staffed for many years. And I know that many departments were coming in talking about their staffing troubles, and I just thought, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I found myself facing a uh, attorney shortage. And so um, luckily, we were able to run a successful recruitment near the end of um, summer, early fall of uh, 22 and we were uh, successful in hiring two new deputy district attorneys. Uh, and so they started in December and then in February. Uh, so we're currently uh, getting them up to speed, training them. Uh, Robin Whitley is a relatively new attorney uh, in general. She's um, handling uh, misdemeanors, some general felonies. We're getting her going on preliminary hearings. Uh, Deputy uh, Robert Anaya has been an attorney for decades uh, in the uh, Merced area, and so he's come on and he's taken our uh, domestic violence prosecutions. Uh, I'll talk briefly about a grant uh, that we have that funds that position. Uh, and then you'll see the only other position that is unfilled at this time is our, in our Investigations Bureau. Uh, we have our Chief Investigator, A.C. Field, and then we have uh, one full-time investigative assistant and one part-time investigative assistant. And uh, so our investigator position that was formerly filled by uh, now under Sheriff uh, Perry has been vacant for a while and um, there has not been um, a lot of interest in that position. So uh, as well as our uh, open deputy DA position, we haven't gotten any applications for that position and that's been open for a couple months now. So uh, thankfully, um, investigations and really serious felony investigations in this county are um, challenged by the fact that our sheriff's office and our police department at this point don't have investigators. So they have deputies, they have officers, they have sergeants, 
but really when it comes to like detectives or uh, felony investigators, there really aren't any. I mean, the sheriff's office has difficulty, you know, filling their, um, you know, road deputies, and uh, I think that the PD is planning on getting a detective soon, but staffing it for law enforcement in general has just been a problem. So uh, my investigator, AC Field, has really been tasked with running with the majority of the felony investigations. So search warrants, uh, it has a lot of the tech search warrants, so like Facebook, cell phones, things like that. And then uh, also managing, you know, we get really heavy cases. We have homicides, we have uh, major sexual assaults. Uh, so he's uh, really spread thin. Uh, I've been able to hire a part-time investigative assistant. Uh, she's now with us uh, twice a week and comes with years of experience in sexual assault investigations. So thankfully, she was willing to come on in the role of this part-time temporary help. So that's kind of plugging some of the investigative gaps that we had, but um, at this time, I'm still hoping to uh, fill that investigator spot. Uh, victim witness, uh, that uh, whole division is not funded through gen general fund. It's funded through grant funding. And my coordinator, David Wadsworth, is responsible for uh, making sure the grant is completed on time, uh, managing the grant, and then his two advocates, one fully funded by the grant, the other one is half and half between two grants, uh, the Victim Witness Grant and a Vertical Prosecution Grant uh, that I was successful in getting in 2018. Uh, the Victim Witness Office is supervised by me, uh, and we have made great strides in the last several years in getting uh, victim outreach, victim contact. Uh, I'm very proud of my victim witness office. And then of course support staff, the office would not function at all without them. They're amazing. All right. So just uh, briefly, like I said, we have a very straightforward budget, um, salaries and benefits. Attorneys aren't cheap, uh, so uh, that's the big part of the pie there. Uh, professional services and witnesses, um, that's a big chunk. Our, we usually request the same amount of money each year, but the actual amount we use varies depending on how many jury trials we have. If we have to hire any you know, expensive experts to come and talk about cause of death or um, you know, some sort of tech thing that we would need to instruct the jury about. Um, and then also professional services covers all of our transcription costs. With the rise in uh, body camera use, in order for us to present a recording or a video at jury trial, we need to have it transcribed. So we've had to up those costs for transcriptions. They just seem to keep going up every year. Uh, travel and training, attorneys have a, a requirement to have a certain number of continuing legal education hours. We provide that as an office to our attorneys. Uh, books and subscriptions is another um, chunk of our budget, and that also keeps increasing. We pay for licenses for each of our employees so that they can access the um, axon or evidence.com that both the police department and the sheriff's office have now. And so that means that my staff can actually go directly in and look at a particular date and time to see what officers were recording what at what time and so we can make sure that we can obtain and uh, discover to the defense all of the relevant videos or recordings that were taken on a particular day and time. And then miscellaneous communications, insurance, memberships, things like that. I think uh, if you guys have any questions about the budget, um, I'd be happy to answer them, but it's really pretty straightforward. Um, we are a general fund department. That's where the majority of our revenue comes from. Uh, we do have a few uh, offsetting streams of revenue, which um, include uh, billing on Pelican Bay cases, and then we also get a um, portion from AB 109 because when the state uh, did realignment, they uh, kicked some money, and my office now started doing the parole hearings that used to be done at the state level, so we do those at the county level now. We're responsible, so we get um, some AB 109 funding, and then Measure R, uh, we got a portion to uh, give a uh, raise to our DA investigators. And then again, I think I mentioned this earlier, 
We have the Vertical Domestic Violence Prosecution Grant that funds one deputy DA. And so from the time a report comes in on domestic violence to the time the person is sentenced uh, and any probation violations and things like that, we have one attorney handling those. It's been shown that it's best to have one person and bless that person for taking that caseload. Uh, because it's very difficult, uh, so uh, that grant funds that, and a half of the victim's witness advocate is also funded by the, um, we call it the VAWA grant, and then we have our victim witness uh, program grant. And so that is it. I told you I'd be brief. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mix. It was amazing. Does the board have any questions? I, I have one, if I could. Um, is that um, kind of just focused on strategic plan? Are there anything this next year that you're hoping to, is there a system you want to implement? Is there any kind of like strategic plan in this next year that you are looking forward to? Or you could even give me a five year. Okay, so short term, I think in the next year, I just want to fill those vacancies. <laughs> That's kind of my priority. And I would also like to do some team building uh, things like that, um, but in terms of things that I'm going to be asking for money-wise, I don't really have anything on that list other than, of course, we won't have salary savings if I fill those positions. In terms of a more um, long-term plan, we do need some things for the office, like new flooring. Victim Witness has flooring that's been in there since I started in the office, which was 2005. Mm -hmm. So let's just say it seems in better days. <laughs> uh, so just things like that. Um, I, uh, we also have a, a storage here at the Flynn Center that is just like boxes of moldy stuff. And then we have uh, work paperless now. So um, 2017 and forward, we don't have paper files. But we have paper files going back to the 90s, kind of lining a portion of victim witness. So I'm going to be looking at uh, probably finding a company for scanning, uh, shredding, things like that to kind of get rid of that backlog of uh, paper and mess that Are we you have. mandated to hold that for a certain amount of time? Because There's Okay, with in probation we had it like a seven year. You had to you had to get rid of it actually. Right, and some felonies like life, if somebody's serving a life sentence, the appeals and right. uh, writs and things can go on forever. So we'll pick and choose. But like we have misdemeanor files going back, I think to the '90s that wow. need to go. Yeah, <laughs> well, I hear that Dan McCorkle loves to do that sort of thing. So perhaps you could strike something up with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's currently doing it for other things. So. <laughs> and then another thing that I'm kind of thinking about in the grand, grand scheme of things is um, we get a lot of Public Records Act requests, and I think that um, what I'm seeing coming out uh, for DA's offices in general is stats. So um, uh, the state is moving towards like blind charging so the prosecutors don't see certain um, demographic data when they're making charging decisions. Uh, and we're getting asked a lot of questions about what decisions we make about charging, who we charge, who we don't. Uh, and so I'm thinking about e either another staff person or somehow reorganizing my support staff to have somebody dedicated more to uh, intake uh, and stat keeping. Okay, great. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I, I initiated when I went into the sheriff's office is first thing is I had a, a, a records retention policy written, and that is the best thing ever. I guarantee you, because you can start to clear out your uh, out your your stores and and clear out your records and get rid of a lot of those things um, so I would highly encourage doing that the other thing is is that uh, there's been some criticism and so while, while you're here I'll give an opportunity to speak to it but there's been some criticism both from the uh, presentation on public defense as well as uh, as just today and, and uh, from mr. Bieber on the uh, amount of incarceration the heavy overt, quote unquote, you know, uh, that we're one of the uh, most heavily incarcerated counties uh, in Del Norte. And so having you here, I 
love to hear your, uh, your take on this so, you, so the public can understand exactly what we're dealing with here in Delaware County. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, I, when I read the public defender's report, I um, took issue with some of the numbers and conclusions uh, made in it. I've spoken with court staff who I believe wondered where a lot of this information came from. Uh, so I take my job very seriously. I care about public safety in this community. And uh, I think one of the interesting things is that we actually, uh, in this county, incarcerate people on a first time DUI, for instance. Even though the vehicle code says they're supposed to incarcerate people for a first time DUI for 48 hours, most counties don't do that. This county does. So we do have quite a few more people getting booked and held for traffic related uh, offenses. But I think that those are very important. I mean, for me, I think that somebody driving around drunk should spend some time in jail as a deterrent, just because of how danger it is, uh, dangerous it is to our community as a whole. So um, I believe it's my job to file what I can prove and what's important to public safety, and I'm not gonna make any apologies for that. And I think that we have a real problem in our community with crime, and so, I'm just gonna continue to do my job and file the cases that are presented to me that I believe I can uh, win and go from there. The other question I have for you is, and, and thank you for that, because it, it is, uh, I too felt that, that again, the, the assumptions and the uh, claims that, that, that they was made in that report were specious at the best and, and, and not accurate. Because any time that you talk about incarceration, especially of, of any uh, particular race or gender or, or whatever, but any time you talk about incarceration, you cannot talk about a, a factor, whether it's one's race, economics, or whatever. You have to look at what was the crime that they committed that put them behind bars. What was the act that they did that caused their incarceration? And I know, especially during the period of COVID, you know, if you were not awaiting a, a trial and you were not, have done something of a violent nature, you were not in custody. It just was not gonna happen. We, there was no bail requirement. Everybody was out. And th that was part of the problem that we have, not only in our county, but other counties, communities all over California, is when we initiated no bail and we initiated a, a release for anything other than violent felons. You basically taught the, and, and gave the message to the criminal community that there was gonna be no repercussion for what you did. You were spending no time in jail. You were gonna be booked and released or cited on scene, but there was gonna be no. And, and so when you realize there's no punishment, there's nothing that's gonna make you suffer, then there's, there's no incentive not to do it. And, and we see the how, how it's exploded in California. And so the other thing I had a question to you is, what do you foresee in the changes that, that have come through the, through the legal system that you foresee are gonna be challenges that you're gonna face going forward uh, in the next few years, whether that's care court or wh whatever, that you see the changes in juvenile justice, um, that you are, uh, the, you know, I, I think we're looking at a reduction in, in, in what we see coming out of Pelican Bay just because the numbers are, are dwindling. Um, how, are, how are all those factors gonna affect your office? So I was part of uh, Judge Follett's team that created the Integrated Treatment Court uh, and have uh, seen that process work and uh, sat in drug court the other day, so kind of these collaborative courts. And I think that uh, they're gonna be good, I watched some people in drug court the other day that I never would have expected to see doing as well as they were. So when we actually had this kind of community effort uh, to lift these people up and help them, it was really impressive to see. And so my hope is that with some of these uh, other programs that are diverting from incarceration to programs and actually trying a more holistic approach, and especially trying to address mental illness, which is a huge problem, uh, and then, the, of course, the co-occurring disorders with substance abuse 
it's really uh, a problem. And so um, my hope is that these programs will actually make a difference for people. And really in such a small community, if you make a difference for one person, you make a difference for that person's whole family, which can then kind of, you know, spread out and filter through. So I think, you know, the small victories with um, a small number of people here really can make a difference. And challenges that I see are uh, our county departments not being able to staff these positions that are going to be needed to actually provide that help. So. Yes, we're increasing positions in mental health and departments like that and putting more money towards that, but it's necessary. I mean, we need to figure out how to address these root issues of mental illness and substance abuse. And so um, I just think most departments are facing these staffing issues, and I don't think there's a big push for you know, people from larger communities that are paying more to come here and work in our behavioral health department. So I think, um, I see that as um, a problem. And uh, Pelican Bay, there has been a reduction in inmate population, but we're still getting quite a few cases <laughs> out of there. We have quite a few trials. Um, the inmates out there that are there are still managing to commit crimes, and so we're prosecuting those. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes it did in, in, in many ways. And, and again, I, I, again, it's, it's one of the things about the drug courts, um, some some models of mental health courts, very similar to the drug courts, ha have been somewhat successful, at least in, in moderating some behavior. Um, but again, it, it's very problematic, and, and, and we've seen the reduction in those programs, and, and the uh, when when we basically went to this model of, of not uh, charging for minor drug offenses or and or uh, behavior offenses. And so you end up with so many of these that used to be able to be, you know, in lieu of going to jail, you're going to go to drug court. Well, that no longer, that no longer carrot stick model exists. And so, um, you know, in, in, in doing so, especially with the shift with AB 109 and taking away all the uh, lower level offenders out of the prison and kicking down, down to county responsibility. Um, but in doing so, they, they provided insufficient funding to where many of the programs that they had availability there in prison don't exist here mm -hmm. and won't exist here because again we cannot get those services to come mm -hmm. to smaller communities like ours because the funding sources are just not there right. and i appreciate your time thank, thank you. you all right thank you ms mix anything else from the board all right anybody want to do public comment i knew you would mr Drago. <laughs> come on up I'm just going to say, you know, you guys <coughs> brought up uh, the report about, you know, incarcerating people maybe more than in the next community or whatever. Um, but again, the funding, I think 2 million, 2.5, and a half a million, I think, for the public defender's office. And like I said, my customers, I found a fourth, charged with attempted murder. And I just don't, uh, you know, I know the last one certainly was an attempted murder, self-defense. And he was released quickly. I paid for it. I paid for a lawyer to go help him out because uh, you have a really robust <laughs> uh, law enforcement system and a really um, inadequate uh, uh, public defender system. Drug courts, you know, I've been through that. I was a meth addict for a couple of years, and uh, I resented the whole system, you know. Uh, you know, I've had my asshole looked in, my urine analyzed. Um, I was looking for snakes that day. I'm still into reptiles. I was out in a field. I usually get kind of screwed up by cops, but this is the first time I went somewhere. And, um, you know, when I got sober, I, I found a community that cared about me, that wasn't funded to penalize me. I went to Narcotics Anonymous, those little 12-step meetings and that kind of thing. And some people maybe have better constitutions than others. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's other people that need more help. But um, uh, Dean, Dean brought it up. And, um, You know, it's, uh, uh, with the, I think you mentioned the, the salaries, you're having a hard time keeping officers and all, and we've never talked about the real reason. We always said it was because it was hard to keep somebody that was relatively, 
very few hours. The dogs have more training than, you know, about twice as many hours to get become a police dog. And uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I do feel that because of my speech sometimes that I've been, I had to pay extra taxes in the community that you guys vote to set them each year. This year, Joel threw out there, hey, the tribe, you know, I think Joel was trying to save your butt. It's like, they're not even going to discuss the taxes and they're going to vote to set them even after an election year where they thought it should have gone the other way. But um, I would be the role model for your community, and I would try to represent the people who, you know, don't feel represented. The last fellow over here obviously doesn't feel represented. A lot of people don't even vote. You know, your guys should, uh, goal should be to try to attract the people who don't vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drago. Anyone else? All right, we'll close public comment. Thank you again, Ms. Mix, for that great presentation. Um, we will take all your comments into consideration when we're developing our strategic plan and how we can support you. With that, I believe we are adjourned, and our next meeting will be May 9th, 2023, and we are hoping that Supervisor Short is getting well. Thank you.